Phantom, The Sword of Truth, Book 10, by Terry Goodkind. Read by Nick Sullivan. This book contains 587 pages, Chapter 1. Kalin stood quietly in the shadows, watching as evil knocked softly on the door. Huddled under the small overhang off to the side, she hoped that no one would answer that knock. As much as she would like to spend the night in out of the rain, she didn't want trouble to visit innocent people. She knew, though, that she had no say in the matter. The light of a single lantern flickered weakly through the slender windows to either side of the door, reflecting a pale, shimmering glow off the wet floor of the portico. The sign overhead, hung by two iron rings, grated and squealed each time it swung back and forth in the wind-borne rain. Kalin was able to make out the spectral white shape of a horse painted on the dark, wet sign. The light from the windows wasn't enough to enable her to read the name, but because the other three women with her had talked of little else for days, Kalin knew that the name would be the White Horse Inn. By the smell of manure and wet hay, she judged that one of the dark buildings nearby had to be a stable. In the sporadic displays of distant lightning, she could just make out the hulking shoulders of dark structures standing like ghosts beyond the billowing sheets of rain. Despite the steady roar of the deluge and the rumble of thunder, it appeared that the village was sound asleep. Kalin could think of no better place to be on such a dark and wretched night than bundled up under bed covers, safe and warm. A horse in the nearby stable whinnied when Sister Ulyssia knocked a second time, louder, more insistently, evidently intending herself to be heard over the riot of rain, yet not so loud as to sound hostile. Sister Ulyssia, a woman given to reckless impulse, seemed to be taking a deliberately restrained approach. Kalin didn't know why, but imagined that it had to do with the reason they were there. It also might have been nothing more than the random nature of her moods. Like lightning, the woman's smoldering bad temper was not only dangerous but unpredictable. Kalin couldn't always tell exactly when Sister Ulyssia would lash out, and just because she so far hadn't didn't mean that she wouldn't. Neither of the other two sisters was in any better mood or any less inclined toward losing their temper. Kalin supposed that soon enough the three of them would be happy and quietly celebrating the reunion. Lightning flashed close enough that the blinding but halting incandescence briefly revealed a whole street of buildings crowded close around the muddy, rutted road. Thunder boomed through the mountainous countryside, and shook the ground beneath their feet. Kalin wished that there was something, like the way lightning revealed things otherwise hidden in the obscurity of night, that could help illuminate the hidden memories of her past and bring to light what was concealed by the murky mystery of who she was. She had a fierce longing to be free of the sisters, a burning desire to live her own life, to know what her life really was. That much she knew about herself. She knew, too, that her convictions had to be founded in experience. It was obvious to her that there had to be something there, people and events, that had helped make her the woman she was, but try as she might to recall them, they were lost to her. That terrible day she stole the boxes for the sisters, she had promised herself that someday she would find the truth of who she was, and she would be free. When Sister Ulyssia knocked a third time, a muffled voice came from inside. I heard you. It was a man's voice. His bare feet thumped down wooden stairs. I'll be right there. A moment, please. His annoyance at having been awakened in the middle of the night was layered over with forced deference to potential customers. Sister Ulyssia turned a sullen look on Kalin. You know that we have business here. She lifted a cautionary finger before Kalin's face. Don't you even think of giving us any trouble, or you'll get what you got the last time. Kalin swallowed at the reminder. Yes, Sister Ulyssia. 
Tovey had better have gotten us a room, Sister Cecilia complained. I'm in no mood to be told the place is full. There will be room, Sister Armina said with soothing assurance, cutting off Sister Cecilia's habit of always assuming the worst. Sister Armina wasn't older, like Sister Cecilia, but nearly as young and attractive as Sister Ulyssia. To Kalin, though, their looks were insignificant in light of their inner nature. To Kalin, they were vipers. One way or another, Sister Ulyssia added under her breath as she glared at the door, there will be room. Lightning arced through the greenish roiling clouds, releasing an ear-splitting boom of thunder. The door opened a crack. The shadowed face of a man peered out at them as he worked to button up his trousers under his nightshirt. He moved his head a little to each side so that he could take in the strangers. Judging them to be less than dangerous, he pulled open the door and with a sweeping gesture ushered them inside. Come on in then, he said, all of you. Who is it? A woman called out as she descended the stairs to the rear. She carried a lantern in one hand and held the hem of her nightdress up with the other so that she wouldn't trip on it as she hurried down the steps. Four women traveling in the middle of a rainy night, the man told her, his gruff tone alluding to what he thought of such a practice. Kalin froze in mid-stride. He'd said four women. He had seen all four of them and had remembered as much long enough to say so. As far as she could recall, such a thing had never happened before. No one but her masters, the four sisters, the three with her and the one they had come to meet, ever remembered seeing her. Sister Cecilia shoved Kalin in ahead of her, apparently not catching the significance of the remark. Well, for goodness sake, the woman said as she hurried between the two plank tables. She tisked at the foul weather as the wind drove a rattle of rain against the windows. Do get them in out of that awful weather, Orlin. Streamers of fat raindrops chased them in the door, wetting a patch of pine floor. The man's mouth twisted with displeasure as he pushed the door closed against a wet gust and then dropped the heavy iron bar back in the brackets to bolt the door. The woman, her hair gathered up in a loose bun, lifted her lantern a little as she peered at the late-night guests. Puzzled, she squinted as her gaze swept over the drenched visitors and then back again. Her mouth opened, but then she seemed to forget what she had been about to say. Kalin had seen that blank look a thousand times and knew that the woman only remembered seeing three callers. No one could ever remember seeing Kalin long enough to say so. She was as good as invisible. Kalin thought that maybe because of the darkness and rain, the man, Orlin, had merely made a mistake when he'd said to his wife that there were four visitors. Come in and get yourselves dry, the woman said as she smiled in earnest warmth. She hooked a hand under Sister Ulyssia's arm, drawing her into the small gathering room. Welcome to the White Horse Inn. The other two sisters, openly scrutinizing the room, took off their cloaks and gave them a quick shake before tossing them over a bench at one of the two tables. Kalin noticed a single dark doorway at the back, beside the stairs. A fireplace made of stacked flat stones took up most of the wall to the right. The air in the dimly lit room was warm and carried the distractingly enticing aroma of a stew in the iron pot hung from a crane pushed to the side of the hearth. Hot coals glowed out from under a thick layer of feathery ashes. You three ladies look like drowned cats. You must be miserable. The woman turned to the man and gestured. Orlin, get the fire going. Kalin saw a young girl of maybe eleven or twelve years slip down the stairs just far enough so she could see into the room from under the low ceiling. Her long, white nightdress with ruffled cuffs had a pony stitched in coarse brown thread on the front with a row of loose strands of dark yarn making up the mane and tail. The girl sat on the steps to watch, tenting her nightdress over her bony knees. Her grin revealed big teeth that she had yet to grow into. Strangers arriving in the middle of the night apparently was an adventure at the White Horse Inn. Kalin dearly hoped 
that that was all there would be to the adventure. Orlin, a big bear of a man, knelt at the hearth, stacking on a few sticks of wood. His thick, stubby fingers made the wedges of oak look to be a little more than kindling. What would possess you ladies to travel in the rain at night, he asked as he cast them a look over his shoulder. We're in a hurry to catch up with a friend of ours, Sister Ulyssia said, offering a meaningless smile. She kept her tone businesslike. She was to meet us here. Her name is Tovey. She will be expecting us. The man put a hand on his knee to help himself up. Those guests who stay with us, especially in such troubled times, are pretty discreet. Most don't give their names. He lifted an eyebrow at Sister Ulyssia. Much like you ladies, not giving your names, that is. Orlin, their guests, the woman scolded. Wet and no doubt tired and hungry guests. She flashed a smile. Folks call me Emmy. My husband Orland and I have run the white horse since his parents passed away years back. Emmy gathered up three wooden bowls from a shelf. You ladies must be famished. Let me get you some stew. Orlin, get some mugs and fetch these ladies some hot tea. Orlin lifted a meaty hand on his way past, indicating the bowls his wife cradled in an arm. You're one short. She twitched a frown at him. No, I'm not. I have three bowls. Orlin pulled four mugs down from the top shelf of the hutch. Right, like I said, you're one short. Kalin could hardly breathe. Something was very wrong. Sisters Cecilia and Armina had frozen dead still, their wide eyes fixed on the man. The significance of the couple's chit-chat had not escaped them. Kalin glanced to the stairwell and saw the girl on the steps leaning toward them, gripping the rails, peering out, trying to fathom what her parents were talking about. Sister Armina snatched Sister Ulyssia's sleeve. Ulyssia, she said in an urgent whisper through gritted teeth, he sees. Sister Ulyssia shushed her. Her brow drew down in a dark glare as she turned her attention back to the man. You are mistaken, she said. There are only three of us. At the same time she was talking, she prodded Kalin with the stout oak rod she carried, shoving her farther back into the shadows behind, as if shadows alone would make Kalin invisible to the man. Kalin didn't want to be in the shadows. She wanted to stand in the light and be seen, really seen. Such a thing had always seemed an impossible dream, but it had suddenly become a real possibility. That possibility had shaken the three sisters. Orlin frowned at Sister Ulyssia. Holding all four mugs in the grip of one meaty hand, he used his other to point out each visitor standing in his gathering room. One, two, three. He leaned to the side, looking around Sister Ulyssia to point at Kalin. Four. Do you all want tea? Kalin blinked in astonishment. Her heart felt as if it had come up in her throat. He saw her and remembered what he saw. Chapter 2 It can't be, Sister Cecilia whispered as she wrung her hands. She leaned toward Sister Ulyssia, her eyes darting about. It's impossible. Her familiar incessant but meaningless smile was nowhere in evidence. Something's gone wrong. Sister Armina's voice trailed off when her sky-blue eyes glanced Sister Ulyssia's way. It's nothing more than an anomaly, Sister Ulyssia growled under her breath as she leveled a dangerous look at the two of them. Never ones to be servile, the two nonetheless showed no evidence of wanting to argue with their stormy leader. In three strong strides, Sister Ulyssia closed the distance to Orlan. She seized the collar of his nightshirt in her fist. With her other hand, she swished her oak rod in the direction of Kalin, standing in the shadows back near the door. What does she look like? Like a drowned cat, Orlan said in ill humor, obviously not liking her hand on his collar. 
Kaylin knew without doubt that using such a tone of voice with Sister Ulysses was the wrong thing to do, but the sister, instead of exploding in a rage, seemed to be just as astonished as Kaylin. I know that, but what does she look like? Tell me what you see. Orlin straightened, pulling his collar away from her grip. His features drew tight as he appraised the stranger only he and the sisters saw standing in the weak light of the lanterns. Thick hair, green eyes, a very attractive woman. She'd look a lot better if she were dried out, although those wet things on her do tend to show off what she's made of. He began to smile in a way that Kalen didn't like one bit, even if she was overjoyed that he really saw her. Mighty fine figure on her, he added, more to himself than the sister. His slow and deliberate evaluation made Kalen feel naked. As his gaze roamed over her, he wiped the corner of his mouth with a thumb. She could hear it rasp against his stubble. One of the sticks of wood in the hearth caught flame, brightening the room in its flickering glow, letting him see even more. His gaze wandered upward and then caught on something. Her hair is as long as... Orlin's body smile evaporated. He blinked in surprise. His eyes widened. Dear spirits, he whispered as his face went ashen. He dropped to a knee. Forgive me, he said, addressing Kalin. I didn't recognize. The room rang with a crack as Sister Ulysses whacked him across the top of the head with her oak rod, dropping him to both knees. Silence! What's the matter with you? The man's wife cried out as she rushed to her husband's side. She squatted, putting an arm around his shoulders to steady him as he groaned and put a big hand over the bloody wound on the top of his bowed head. His sandy-colored hair turned dark and wet under his fingers. Are all of you crazy? She cradled her husband's head to her breast, where a red stain grew against her nightdress. He appeared stunned senseless. Unless you travel in the company of a spirit, there are only three of you. How dare you... Silence, Sister Ulysses growled in a way that gave Kalin an icy shiver and made the woman's mouth snap closed. Rain pattered against the window, while in the distance a slow rumble of thunder rolled through the forested hills. Kalin could hear the sign squeaking as it swung to and fro each time the wind gusted. Inside the house it had gone dead silent. Sister Ulysses looked over at the girl, now at the bottom of the steps, where she stood gripping the simple square wooden newel post. Sister Ulysses fixed the girl in a glare that only a sorceress in a vile mood could marshal. How many visitors do you see? The girl stood wide-eyed, too frightened to speak. How many? Sister Ulysses asked again, this time through gritted teeth in a voice so threatening that it made the girl's grip on the newel post tighten until her fingers stood out white and bloodless against the dark wood. The girl finally answered in a meek voice, Three. Sister Armina, looking like bottled thunder, leaned close. Ulysses, what's going on? This isn't supposed to be possible, not possible at all. We cast the verification webs. Exterior, Sister Cecilia corrected. Sister Armina blinked at the older woman. What? We only cast exterior verification webs. We didn't do an interior review. Are you out of your mind? Sister Armina snapped. In the first place, it isn't necessary. And in the second place, who would be fool enough to be the one to do an aspect analysis of a verification web from an interior perspective? No one ever does such a thing. It isn't necessary. I'm only saying. With a withering look, Sister Ulysses silenced them both. Sister Cecilia, her wet curls plastered to her scalp, looked like she was about to finish her complaint, but then decided instead to remain mute. Orlin seemed to recover his senses as he pulled away from his wife's embrace and began to stagger to his feet. Blood ran down his forehead and to either side of his broad nose. 
Were I you, innkeeper, Sister Ulyssia said, turning her attention back to him, I'd remain on my knees. The menace in her voice gave him pause for only a moment. He was clearly angry as he rose up to his full height, letting his bloody hand drop away from his head. His back straightened, his chest expanded, and his fists tightened. Kalin could clearly tell that his temper was outpacing his sense of caution. Sister Ulyssia indicated with her rod that she wanted Kalin to back away. Kalin ignored the direction, instead stepped closer to Sister Ulyssia, hoping to change the rush of events before it ended up being too late. Please, Sister Ulyssia, he will answer your questions. I know he will. Let him be. The three sisters turned unpleasantly surprised looks on Kalin. She had not been spoken to or asked to speak. Such insolence would cost her dearly, she knew, but she also knew what was liable to happen to the man if something didn't change, and right then it seemed to her that she was the only one who could effect a change. Besides, Kalin knew that this was her only chance to find out something about herself to perhaps find out who she really was and maybe even why she could remember only the most recent parts of her life. This man had clearly recognized her. He very well might be the key that could unlock her lost past. She dared not let the chance slip away, even if she had to risk the sister's wrath. Before the sisters had a chance to say anything, Kalin addressed the man. Please, Master Orlin, listen for a moment. We're looking for an older woman named Tovi. She was to meet these women here. We were delayed, so she should already be here waiting for us. Please answer their questions about their friend. This could all be quickly resolved if you would hurry upstairs and get Tovi for them. Then, like this passing storm, we will all soon be out of your lives. The man reverently dipped his head as if a queen had asked his help. Kalin was not only surprised, but completely bewildered by such an act of deference. But we have no guest named Tovi here. Moth the room lit with a blinding flash, lightning that was the match of anything out in the raging storm the twisting rope of liquid heat and light that ignited from between Sister Ulysses' hands blasted across Orlin's chest before he could finish the appellation he had been about to use. The jarring concussion from being so close to the explosive detonation of such thunderous power hammered deep into the core of Kalin's chest. The impact threw Orlin back, sending him crashing through a table and both benches slamming him against the wall. The deadly contact with such power had nearly cut the man in half. Smoke curled up from what was left of his shirt. A glistening red splatter of gore marked the wall where he'd hit before slumping to the ground. In the aftermath of the deafening blast, Kalin's ears rang in what seemed the sudden silence. Emmy her eyes wide with the shock of an event that had in an instant forever altered the course of her life, wailed the single word, No! Kalin pressed a hand over her mouth and nose, not just in revulsion, but to mask the smell of blood and the stench of burned flesh. The lantern that had been on the table had been thrown to the floor and extinguished, leaving the room mostly to the wavering shadows cast by the fire in the hearth, and the sporadic flashes of lightning coming in the slender windows. Had it not been a night already filled with thunder and lightning, such a blast would surely have awakened the entire town. The wooden bowls Emmy had been holding clattered down onto the floor and rolled drunkenly away. She screamed in horror and ran toward her husband. Sister Ulyssia came unhinged. In a fury, she intercepted Emmy before she could reach her dead husband. Sister Ulyssia slammed the woman against the wall. Where's Tovey? I want answers and I want them right now. Kalin saw that the sister had brought her Dakra to hand, the simple weapon 
looked like nothing more than a knife handle with a sharpened metal rod in place of a blade. All three sisters carried a dakra. Kaelin had seen them use the weapons when they had encountered Imperial Order scouts. She knew that once the dakra had pierced a victim, no matter how minor the penetration, it took only a thought on the sister's part to kill. With the dakra, it was not the wound itself that killed, but rather the sister who, through the dakra, extinguished the spark of life. If the sister didn't withdraw the weapon along with her intent to kill, there was no defense and no chance of salvation. A confusing, faltering flash of lightning lit the room through the narrow windows beside the door, throwing long spikes of shadows across the floor and against the walls as two sisters together snatched the panicked woman, struggling to control her. As the fit of lighting ended and a dark pall again descended over the room, the third sister raced up the stairwell. Kaylin went for the girl. As she ran toward her mother, Kaylin intercepted the girl, hooking her arm around her middle, holding her back. Her eyes went wide in panic, her mind unable to maintain the memory of seeing Kaylin even long enough for her to be aware of who or what had grabbed her, seemingly out of thin air. Far worse, though, she had just seen her father killed. Kaylin knew that the girl would never be able to forget such a terrible sight. Over the steady drumbeat of rain and wind, Kaylin heard the footfalls of the sister upstairs as she rushed down the hallway. She paused intermittently, stopping at each room to throw open a door. Any guests who had been awakened by the commotion and shouting and dared to come out of their room into the dark hall were about to face a sister of the dark on a rampage. Those still asleep behind their doors would face no less. Emmy cried out in pain. Kalen knew why. Where is she? Sister Ulyssia yelled at the woman. Where's Tovey? Emmy screamed, begging that her daughter not be harmed. Kalen knew that it was a grave tactical mistake to betray to an enemy what you feared most. In this case, however, she supposed that such information was irrelevant. Not only was it pretty obvious what a mother would fear, but the sisters needed no such leverage. Seeing her mother in a state of unbridled terror was only serving to frighten the child all that much more. She struggled mightily. Despite her frantic effort, such a slender girl was no match for Kaylin. Holding the girl tightly, Kaylin pulled her back through the doorway behind the stairs and into the darkened room beyond. In the flashes of lightning coming through a window at the rear, Kalin saw that it was a kitchen and storage area for supplies. The girl cried in wild panic that was the match of her mother's. It's all right, Kalin whispered in the girl's ear as she held her tight, trying to calm her. I'll protect you. It's all right. Kalin knew that it was a lie, but her heart would not allow the truth. The slender slip of a girl pawed at Kalin's arms. It must have seemed to her as if she were being held by a spirit clutching at her from the underworld. If she even saw Kalin, Kalin knew that the girl would forget her before her mind could transform perception into cognition. Likewise, Kalin's words of comfort would evaporate from the girl's mind before they had a chance to even begin to be comprehended. Within an instant after seeing her, no one ever remembered that Kalin existed. Except Orlin. And now he was dead. Kalin hugged the terrified girl tight. She didn't know if it wasn't really more for her own sake than the girl's. At that moment, keeping the girl away from the terror of what was befalling her parents was all Kalin could do. The girl, for her part, writhed madly in Kalin's arms, trying to twist away as if she were being held by a monster intent on bloody murder. Kalin hated adding to her terror, but letting her go out into the other room would be worse. Lightning flashed again, making Kalin glance to the window. The window was large enough for her to get through. It was dark outside, and the dense forest lay tight up to the buildings. 
She had long legs. She was strong and quick. She knew that if she chose, she could in a few heartbeats be through the window and into the thick of the woods. But she had tried to escape the sisters before. She knew that neither night nor woods would conceal her from women with such dark talents. Kneeling there in the dark, her arms holding the girl in a tight embrace, Kalin began to tremble. The mere contemplation of an attempt at escape was enough to make her brow bead in sweat for fear that such a notion would unleash within her the embedded constraints. Her head swam dizzily with the memory of past attempts, memories of the agony. She couldn't take such suffering again, not when it was to no purpose. Escaping the sisters was impossible. When she glanced up, Kalin saw the dark shadow of a sister descending the stairs. Ulyssia, the woman called out. It was Sister Cecilia's voice. The upstairs rooms are all empty. There are no guests. In the front room, Sister Ulyssia growled a dark curse. The shadow of Sister Cecilia turned from the stairs to fill the doorway like death itself turning its withering gaze on the living. Beyond, Emmy wailed and wept. In her confusion, grief, pain, and terror, she was unable to answer Sister Ulysses' shouted questions. Do you want your mother to die? Sister Cecilia asked from the doorway in that deadly calm voice of hers. She was no less cruel or dangerous than Sister Armina or Sister Ulyssia, but she had a quiet, composed way of speaking that was somehow more terrifying than Sister Ulyssia's screaming. Sister Armina's straightforward threats were simple and sincere, but delivered with a bit more bile. Sister Tovey had a kind of sick glee in her approach to discipline and even torture. When any of them wanted something, though, Kalin had long ago learned that to deny them would only bring nearly unimaginable suffering, and in the end, what they had wanted in the first place. Do you? Sister Cecilia repeated with calm directness. Answer her, Kalin whispered in the girl's ear. Please answer her questions. Please. No, the girl managed. Then tell us where Tovey is. In the room behind Sister Cecilia, the girl's mother gasped in a terrible rattle and then went silent. Kalin heard bony thumps as the woman hit the wood floor. The house fell quiet. From the dim, flickering light beyond the doorway, two more shadows glided up behind Sister Cecilia. Kalin knew that Emmy would answer no more questions. Sister Cecilia slipped into the room closer to the girl Kalin held tightly in her arms. The rooms are all empty. Why are there no guests in your inn? None have come, the girl managed as she shook. Word of the invaders from the old world has scared people away. Kalin knew that that made sense. After leaving the people's palace in Dahara and swiftly traveling south through mostly remote country on a small riverboat, they still had encountered detachments of Emperor Jagang's troops more than once or been through river settlements where those brutes had been. Word of such atrocities would have spread like an ill wind. Where is Tovey, Sister Cecilia asked. Holding the girl protectively away from the sisters, Kalin glared up at them. She's just a child. Leave her be. A shock of pain slammed into her. It felt to Kalin as if every fiber of every muscle had violently ripped. For an instant, she didn't know where she was or what was happening. The room spun her back hit the cupboards with bone-breaking force. Doors flew open. Pots, pans, and utensils cascaded out, bouncing and clattering across the wooden floor. Dishes and glasses shattered as they came crashing down. Kalin slammed face down onto the floor. Jagged, broken shards of pottery slashed her palms as she tried unsuccessfully to break her fall. When she felt the end of something razor-sharp, 
pressing against the side of her tongue in back, she realized that a long sliver of glass had pierced her cheek. She clenched her jaw, snapping off the glass between her teeth so that it wouldn't slash open her tongue. With effort, she managed to spit out the bloody, dagger-like piece of glass. She lay sprawled on the floor, stunned, disoriented, unable to fully gather her senses. Grunts escaped her throat as she tried without success to move. She found that as those sounds slipped out, she couldn't draw a new breath back in. Each bit of air that escaped her lungs was a bit of air lost to her. Her muscles strained to pull the wind back into her lungs. The pain lancing through her middle was paralyzing, acting to counter her effort to get a breath. In desperation, she gasped, at last managing to pull in an urgent breath. She spat out more blood and sharp splinters of glass. She was just beginning to feel the twinge of pain from the fragment still stuck through her cheek. Kaylin couldn't seem to make her arms work, couldn't lift herself up from the floor, much less reach up to pull out the piece of glass. She turned her eyes upward. She could make out the dark forms of the sisters closing in around the girl. They lifted her and shoved her back against a heavy butcher block standing in the center of the room. A sister held each arm as Sister Ulysses squatted down before the girl to meet her panicked gaze. Do you know who Tovey is? The old woman, the girl cried out. The old woman! Yes, the old woman. What else do you know about her? The girl gulped air, almost unable to get the words out. Big. She was big. Old and big. She was too big to walk real good. Sister Ulysses leaned close, gripping the girl's slender throat. Where is she? Why isn't she here? She was supposed to meet us here. Why is she gone? Gone, the girl cried. She's gone. Why? When was she here? When did she leave? Why did she leave? A few days back, she was here. She stayed with us for a while, but she left a few days back. Sister Ulysses, with a cry of rage, lifted the girl and heaved her against the wall. With all her effort, Kaelin struggled to her hands and knees. The girl crashed down to the floor. Ignoring how wobbly she felt, Kaelin crawled across the floor, across broken glass and pottery, and threw herself protectively across the girl's body. The girl, not knowing what was happening, cried out all the more. Footsteps came toward her. Kaelin saw a cleaver lying on the floor nearby. The girl cried and struggled to get away, but Kaelin held her protectively against the floor. As the shadows of the woman came closer, Kaelin's fingers closed around the wooden handle of the heavy cleaver. She wasn't thinking. She was simply acting. Threat? Weapon. It was almost like watching someone else doing it. But there was a kind of deep inner satisfaction at having a weapon in her hand. Her fist tightened around the blood-slicked handle. A weapon was life. Flashes of lightning glinted off the steel. When the women were close enough, Kaelin suddenly raised her arm to strike. Before she could begin to accomplish her task, she felt a gut-wrenching blow, as if she had been rammed by the butt-end of a log. The power of that blow hurled her across the room. A hard impact against the wall stunned her. The room seemed like it was far away, off at the far end of a long, dark tunnel. Pain swamped her. She tried to lift her head, but couldn't. Darkness pulled her in. The next time she opened her eyes, Kaelin saw the girl cringing before the sisters as they towered over her. I don't know, the girl was saying. I don't know why she left. She said she had to be on her way to Casca. The room rang with silence. Casca? Sister Armina finally asked. Yes, that's what she said. She had to get to Casca. Did she have anything with her? 
with her? The girl whined, still sobbing and shivering. I don't understand. What do you mean with her? With her, Sister Ulysses screamed. What did she have with her? She had to be carrying things. A pack, a water skin. But she had other things. Did you see anything else of what she had with her? When the girl hesitated, Sister Ulysses smacked her across the face hard enough to have loosened her teeth. Did you see anything she had with her? A long string of blood from the girl's nose lay horizontally across her cheek. When she was at supper one day, I went to take her clean towels, and I saw something in her room, something strange. Sister Cecilia leaned down. Strange? Like what? It was... it was like a... a box. She had it wrapped in a white dress, but the dress was silky smooth, and it had partly slipped off the box. It was like a box, only it was all black, but not black like paint. It was black like night itself, black like it would take the light right out of the day. The three sisters straightened and stood in silence. Kalin knew what the girl was talking about. Kalin had gone in and taken all three of those boxes from the Garden of Life in the People's Palace, from Lord Rawl's palace. When she had brought the first one out, Sister Ulysia had been furious at Kalin for not bringing all three of them out at once, but they were larger than expected, and there had been no room to hide them all in her pack, so Kalin had at first brought out only one. Sister Ulysia had wrapped that vile thing in Kalin's white dress and had given it to Tovey, telling her to hurry and be on her way, that they would all meet up later. Sister Ulysia hadn't wanted to risk getting caught in the palace with one of the three boxes, and so she hadn't wanted Sister Tovey to wait while Kalin went back up into the Garden of Life after the other two boxes. Why did Tovey go to Casca? Sister Ulysia asked. I don't know, the girl wept. I don't know, I swear I don't. I only know that I heard her say to my parents that she had to be on her way to Casca. She left a few days back. In the quiet, lying against the floor, Kalin struggled to breathe. Each breath sent agonizing stitches of pain through her ribs. She knew that it was only going to be the beginning of the pain. When the sisters finished with the girl, they would turn their attention to Kalin. Maybe we had better get some sleep in out of the rain, Sister Armina finally suggested. We can start out early. Sister Ulysia, her fist with the dacra on her hip, paced between the girl and the butcher block, thinking. Shards of pottery crunched under her boots. No, she said as she turned back to the others. Something is wrong. You mean with the spell form? You mean because of the man? Sister Ulysia waved a hand dismissively. An anomaly, nothing more. No, something is wrong about the rest of it. Why would Tovey leave? She had explicit instructions to meet us here, and she was here. But then she leaves. There were no other guests, no Imperial Order troops in the area. She knew we were on our way, and yet she leaves. It makes no sense. And why Casca, Sister Cecilia asked. Why would she head for Casca? Sister Ulysia turned back to the girl. Who visited Tovey while she was here? Who came to see her? I already told you, no one. No one at all came here while the old woman was staying with us. We had no other callers or guests. She was the only one here. This place is out of the way. People don't come here for stretches. Sister Ulysia went back to her pacing. I don't like it. Something is wrong about this, but I can't put my finger on it. I agree, Sister Cecilia said. Tovey wouldn't just leave. And yet she did. Why? Sister Ulysia came to a stop before the girl. Did she say anything else, or leave a message, perhaps a letter? The girl, sniffling back a sob, shook her head. We have no choice, Sister Ulysia muttered. 
We're going to have to follow Tovey to Casca. Sister Armina gestured toward the front door. Tonight? In the rain? Don't you think we ought to wait until morning? Sister Ulyssia, deep in thought, looked up at the woman. What if someone shows up? We don't need any more complications if we're to accomplish our task. We certainly don't need Jagang or his troops getting a whiff of us being about. We need to get to Tovey, and we need to get that box. We all know what's at stake. She took the measure of both women's grave expressions before going on. What we don't need are any witnesses who can report that we were here and what we're looking for. Kaelin knew very well what Sister Ulyssia was getting at. Please, she managed as she pushed herself up on shaky arms, please leave her be. She's just a little girl. She doesn't know anything of any value to anyone. She knows Tovey was here. She knows what Tovey has with her. Sister Ulyssia's brow drew tight with displeasure. She knows we were here looking for her. Kaelin struggled to put force into her voice. She is nothing to you. Your sorceresses. She is but a child. She can do you no harm. Sister Ulyssia glanced briefly over her shoulder at the girl. She also knows where we're going. Sister Ulyssia looked deliberately into Kaelin's eyes. Without turning to the girl behind her, and with sudden force, she slammed her dakra back into the girl's midsection. The girl gasped in shock. Still staring down at Kaelin, Sister Ulyssia smiled at such a deed as only evil could smile. Kaelin thought that this must be what it would be like looking into the eyes of the Keeper of the Dead in his lair in the darkest depths of the eternity of the underworld. Sister Ulyssia arched an eyebrow. I don't intend to leave any loose ends. Light seemed to flash from within the girl's wide eyes. She went slack and fell heavily to the floor. Her arms sprawled out at crazy angles. Her lifeless gaze stared fixedly right at Kalen, as if to denounce her for not keeping her word. Her promise to the girl, I'll protect you, rang through Kalen's mind. She cried out in helpless fury as she pounded her fists against the floor. And then she cried out in sudden pain as she was flung back against the wall. Rather than crash to the floor, she stuck there as if held by a great strength. The strength, she knew, was magic. She couldn't breathe. One of the sisters was using her power to constrict Kalen's throat. She strained, trying to get air, as she clawed at the iron collar around her neck. Sister Ulyssia approached and put her face close to Kalen's. You are lucky this day, she said in a venomous voice. We don't have time to make you regret your disobedience. Not right away, anyway. But don't think that you are going to get away with it without suffering the consequences. No, sister, Kalen managed to say with great effort. She knew that not to answer would only make it worse yet. I guess that you're simply too stupid to comprehend how insignificant and powerless you are in the face of your betters. Perhaps this time, when you are given another lesson, even one as lowly and ignorant as you will understand it. Yes, sister. Even though she knew quite well what they would make her endure to teach her that lesson, Kalen would have done the same thing again. She regretted only failing to protect the girl as she had promised. The day she had taken those three boxes out of Lord Rawl's palace, she had left in their place her most prized possession, a small statue of a proud woman, her fists at her side, her back arched, and her head thrown back, as if facing forces that would subdue her but could not. Kalen had gathered strength that day in Richard Rawl's palace, Standing in his garden, looking back at the proud statue she'd had to leave there, 
Kaylin had sworn that she would have her life back. Having her life back meant fighting for life even if it was the life of a little girl she didn't know. Let's go, Sister Ulyssia growled as she marched toward the door, expecting everyone to follow. Kaylin's boots thumped down on the floor when the force pressing her to the wall abruptly released her. She collapsed to her knees, her bloody hands comforting her throat as she gasped for air. Her fingers encountered the hated collar by which the sisters controlled her. Move, Sister Cecilia ordered in a tone that had Kaylin scrambling to her feet. She glanced over her shoulder and saw the poor girl's dead eyes staring at her, watching her go. Chapter 3 Richard stood suddenly. The legs of the heavy wooden chair he'd been sitting in chattered as they slid back across the rough stone floor. His fingertips still rested on the edge of the table where the book he'd been reading lay open, waiting before the silver lantern. There was something wrong with the air. Not with the way it smelled, or with the temperature, or with the humidity, although it was a warm and sticky night. It was the air itself. Something felt wrong about the air. Richard couldn't imagine why he would suddenly be struck with such a thought. He couldn't even begin to imagine what it was that could be the cause of such an odd notion. There were no windows in the small reading room, so he didn't know what it was like outside. If it was clear or windy or stormy, he knew only that it was deep in the night. Kara, not far away behind him, stood up from the thickly padded brown leather chair where she, too, had been reading. She waited, but said nothing. Richard had asked her to read several historical volumes he'd found. Whatever she could find out about the ancient times when the chain fire book had been written might prove helpful. She hadn't complained about the task. Kara rarely complained about anything as long as it didn't in any way prevent her from protecting him. Since she was able to stay right there in the room with him, she'd had no objections to reading the books he'd given her. One of the other Mord Sith, Verdine, could read Hai Daharan and had in the past been very helpful with things written in the ancient language often found in rare books, but Verdine was far away at the People's Palace. That still left uncountable volumes written in their own language for Kara to review. Kara watched him as he peered around at the paneled walls, his gaze passing methodically over the ornamental oddities on the shelves, the lacquered boxes with inlaid silver designs, the small figures of dancers carved from bone, the smooth stones lying in velvet-lined boxes, and the decorative glass vases. Lord Rall, she finally asked, is something wrong? Richard glanced back over his shoulder. Yes, there's something wrong with the air. He realized only after seeing the tense concern in her expression that it must have sounded absurd saying that there was something wrong with the air. To Kara, though, no matter how absurd it might have sounded, all that really mattered was that he thought there might be some kind of trouble, and trouble meant a potential threat. Her leather outfit creaked, as she spun her Aegeal up into her fist. Weapon at the ready, she peered around the little room, searching the shadows as if a ghost might pop out of the woodwork. Her brow drew tighter. The beast, do you think? Richard hadn't considered that possibility. The beast that Jagang had ordered his captured Sisters of the Dark to conjure and send after Richard was always a potential threat. There had been several times in the past when it had seemed to appear out of the very air itself. Try as he might, Richard couldn't tell precisely what it was that felt wrong to him. Although he couldn't put his finger on the source of the sensation, it seemed like maybe it was something he should remember, something he should know, something he should recognize. He couldn't decide if such a feeling was real or merely his imagination. He shook his head. No, I don't think it's the beast. 
not wrong in that way. Lord Rall, on top of everything else, you've been up most of the night reading. Perhaps it's just that you're exhausted. There were times when he did wake with a start just as he began to doze off, foggy and disoriented from the gathering descent into the dark grasp of nightmares that he never remembered when he woke. But this impression was different. It was not something born out of the dullness of dozing off to sleep. Besides, despite his fatigue, he hadn't been about to fall asleep. He was too anxious to sleep. It had been only the day before that he had finally convinced the others that Kalin was real, that she existed, and that she wasn't a figment of his imagination or a delusion caused by an injury. At long last, they now knew that Kalin was not some crazy dream he was having. Now that he at last had some help, his sense of urgency to find her drove him on and kept him wide awake. He couldn't bear to take the time to stop and rest, not now that he had some pieces of the puzzle. Back near the people's palace, questioning Tovi just before she died, Nietzsche had learned the terrible details of how those four women, sisters Ulyssia, Cecilia, Armina, and Tovi, had invoked a chain fire event. When they unleashed powers that had for thousands of years been secreted away in an ancient book, everyone's memory of Kalin, except Richard's, had in an instant been wiped away. Somehow his sword had protected his mind. While he had his memory of Kalin, his sword had later been forfeited in the effort to find her. The theory of a chain fire event had originated with wizards in ancient times. They had been searching for a method that would allow them to slip unseen, ignored, and forgotten among an enemy. They postulated that there was a method to alter people's memory with subtractive power in a way that all the resulting disconnected parts of a person's recollection would spontaneously reconstruct and connect themselves to one another, with the direct consequence being the creation of erroneous memory to fill the voids that had been created when the subject of the conjuring was wiped from people's minds. The wizards who had come up with the theoretical process had, in the end, come to believe that unleashing such an event might very well engender a cascade of events that couldn't be predicted or controlled. They speculated that, much like a wildfire, it would continue to burn through links with other people whose memory had not initially been altered. In the end, they had realized that, with such incalculable, sweeping, and calamitous consequences, a chain fire event had the very real potential to unravel the world of life itself, so they had never dared even to test it. Those four sisters of the dark had on Kalin. They didn't care if they unraveled the world of life. In fact, that was their ultimate goal. Richard had no time to sleep. Now that he had finally convinced Nietzsche, Zed, Kara, Nathan, and Anne that he wasn't crazy, and that Kalin existed in reality, if no longer in their memories, they were committed to helping him. He desperately needed that help. He had to find Kalin. She was his life. She completed him. She was everything to him. Her unique intelligence had captivated him from the first moment he met her. The memory of her beautiful green eyes, her smile, her touch, haunted him. Every waking moment was a living nightmare that there was something more he should be doing. While no one else could remember Kalin, it seemed that Richard could think of nothing else. It often felt to him as if he were her only connection to the world, and if he were to stop remembering her, stop thinking about her, she would finally, once and for all, truly cease to exist. But he realized that if he was to accomplish anything, if he was to ever find Kalin, he sometimes had to force his thoughts of her aside in order to concentrate on the matters at hand. He turned to Kara. You don't feel anything odd? She arched an eyebrow. We're in the wizard's keep, Lord Rall. Who wouldn't feel odd? This place makes my skin crawl. Any worse than usual? 
She heaved a sigh as she ran her hand down the long, single, blonde braid lying over the front of her shoulder. No. Richard snatched up a lantern. Come on. He swept out of the small room and into a long hall layered with thick carpets, as if there were too many carpets on hand and the corridor had been the only place that could be found to put them. They were mostly classic designs, woven in subdued colors, but a few peeking out from underneath were composed of bright yellows and oranges. The carpets muted his boots as he marched past double doors to each side opened into dark rooms. Kara, with her long legs, had no difficulty keeping up with him. Richard knew that a number of the rooms were libraries, while others were elaborately decorated rooms seeming to serve no purpose other than to lead to other rooms, which led to other rooms, some simple and some ornate, all a part of the inscrutable and complex maze that was the keep. At an intersection, Richard took a right, down a hall with walls thickly plastered in spiral designs that had mellowed over the centuries to a warm golden brown. When they reached a stairway, Richard hooked his hand on the polished white marble newel post and took to the stairs heading down. Glancing up the stairwell, he could see it climb around the square shaft high up into darkness into the distant upper reaches of the keep. Where are we going? Kara asked. Richard was a bit startled by the question. I don't know. Kara shot him a dark look. You just thought we would go search through a place with thousands upon thousands of rooms? A place as big as a mountain? A place built partly into a mountain until you happen across something? There's something wrong with the air. I'm just following that perception of it. You're following air, Kara said in a flat, mocking tone. Her suspicion flared again. You aren't trying to use magic, are you? Kara, you know as well as anyone that I don't know how to use my gift. I couldn't call upon magic if I wanted to. And he most certainly didn't want to. If he were to call upon his gift, the beast would be better able to find him. Kara, ever protective, was worried that he would carelessly do something to call the beast that had been conjured at the orders of Emperor Jagang. Richard turned his attention back to the problem at hand and tried to discern what it was about the air that seemed so strange to him. He put his mind to analyzing precisely what it was that he sensed. He thought that it felt something like the air during a thunderstorm. It had that edgy, spooky quality. At the bottom, several flights down the white marble stairs, they emerged in a simple corridor made of stone blocks. They followed the corridor straight through several intersections and came to a halt as Richard stared down a dark spiral of stone steps with an iron railing. Kara followed as he finally started down. At the bottom, they passed through a short passage with a barrel ceiling of oak plants before coming out into a room that was the center of a hub of halls. The round room had speckled gray granite pillars all around the outside holding gilded lintels above each passage that went off into darkness. Richard held out the lantern, squinting as he tried to see into the dark passages. He didn't recognize the round room, but he did recognize that they were in a part of the keep that was somehow different, different in a way that made him understand what Kara meant when she said the place made her skin crawl. One of the corridors, unlike the others, led at a rather steep angle down a long ramp, apparently toward some of the deeper areas of the keep. He wondered why there would be a ramp rather than yet more of the endless variety of stairs. This way, he told Kara, as he led her down the ramp and into the darkness. The ramp seemed endless in its descent. Finally, though, it emptied into a grand hall that, while not more than a dozen feet wide, had to be seventy feet high. Richard felt like an ant at the bottom of a long, narrow slit deep in the ground. To the left side rose a natural rock wall that had been chiseled right out of the mountain itself, while tightly fit enormous stone blocks 
formed the wall on the right. They passed a series of rooms in the block wall as they made their way onward in what seemed an endless split through the mountain. As they moved steadily ahead, the lantern light was not strong enough to reveal any end in sight. Richard suddenly realized what it was that he sensed. The air felt the way it occasionally felt in the immediate area around certain people he knew who were powerful with the gift. He remembered the way the air itself seemed to crackle around his former teachers, sisters Cecilia, Armina, Marissa, and especially Nietzsche. He remembered times when it seemed as if the air around Nietzsche might ignite, so great was the singular power radiating from her. But that sensation had always been in close proximity to the individual. It had never been a pervasive phenomenon. Even before he saw the light coming from one of the rooms in the distance, he felt the air coming from the place. He half expected to see the air in the entire hallway begin to sparkle, Immense brass-clad doors stood open, leading into what appeared to be a dimly lit library. He knew that this was the place he was looking for. Walking through those doors with elaborate engraved symbols covering them, Richard froze in mid-stride and stared in astonishment. A flickering flash of lightning came in through a dozen round-topped windows and illuminated row upon row of shelves all around the cavernous room. The windows, rising two stories, ran the entire length of the far wall. Two-story polished mahogany columns rose up between them, hung with heavy dark green velvet draperies. Gold fringe lined the edges of the drapes, and swagged tassels held them back from the windows. The small squares of glass that made up the soaring windows were not clear, but thick and composed of numerous rings, as if the glass had been overly thick when poured. When the lightning flashed, it made the glass seem to light as well. Lanterns with reflectors all around the room lent the place a soft, warm glow, and reflected off the polished tabletops here and there between the confused disarray of books lying open everywhere. The shelves were not what Richard had at first expected. There were indeed books on a number of them, but other shelves held clutters of objects, everything from neatly folded sparkling cloth to iron spirals to green glass flasks to complex objects made of wooden rods to stacks of vellum scrolls, to ancient bones and long curved fangs that Richard didn't recognize and couldn't begin to guess at. When the lightning flashed again, the shadows of the window mullions running over everything in the room, running across tables, chairs, columns, bookcases, and desks, made it appear as if the whole place were cracking apart. Zed, what in the world are you doing? Lord Rall, Kara said in a low voice from right over his shoulder. I think your grandfather must be crazy. Zed turned to peer briefly at Richard and Kara standing back in the doorway. The old man's wavy white hair, standing out in every direction, looked a pale shade of orange in the lamplight, but white as snow whenever the lightning flashed. We're a bit busy right now, my boy. In the center of the room, Nietzsche floated just above one of the massive tables. Richard blinked, trying to be sure that he really saw what he thought he saw. Nietzsche's feet were clear of the table by a hand's width. She stood poised dead still in midair. As impossible and startling as such a sight was, that wasn't the worst of it. On the top of the table was drawn a magical design known as a grace. It appeared to have been drawn with blood. Like a curtain encircling Nietzsche, moving lines also hung suspended in the air above the grace. Richard had seen a number of gifted people draw spell forms before, so he was pretty sure that that was what he was seeing, but he had never seen anything approaching this midair maze consummately complex, 
composed of lines of glowing green light. It hung in the air like a three-dimensional spell form. In the center of that intricate geometric framework, Nietzsche floated as still as a statue. Her exquisite features seemed frozen to stone. One hand was lifted out a ways. The fingers of her other hand at her side were spread. Her feet weren't level as if standing, but dangled as if she were in mid-jump. Her fall of blonde hair was lifted out a little, as if in the midst of that jump up into the air, her hair had risen away from her head just before she was about to come back down, and at that precise instant she had been turned to stone. She didn't look alive. Chapter 4 Richard stood transfixed, staring at Nietzsche poised in midair just above a heavy library table, a net of glowing green geometric lines tangled all around her. Nothing on her moved. She didn't appear to be breathing at all. Her blue eyes stared unblinking into the distance, as if gazing on a world only she could see. Her familiar, exquisite features looked perfectly preserved in the greenish cast given off by the glowing lines. Richard thought that she looked more dead than alive, the way a corpse in a casket looked just before being laid to rest. It was an impossibly beautiful and at the same time profoundly alarming sight. She appeared to be nothing so much as a lifeless statue made of flesh and light. Skeins of her blonde hair in twisting gentle arcs and curves, even individual strands of hair, stood out unmoving in midair. Richard kept expecting her to finally and suddenly finish her fall back to the table. When he realized that he was holding his breath, he at last let it out. Seemingly in sympathy with the tempestuous intensity of the lightning out beyond the wall of windows, the air in the room fairly crackled with the power that had been focused into what was obviously, even to Richard's untrained eye, an extraordinary conjuring. It had been that rare quality to the air that had first caught his attention back in the small reading room. For the life of him, Richard could not imagine what was going on. What could be the purpose of such a use of magic? He was at once fascinated by it and disconcerted that he knew so little about such things. More than anything, though, he found the sight darkly frightening. Having grown up in Westland, where there had been no magic, he sometimes wondered what he had missed, especially at times like this, when he felt hopelessly ignorant. But at other times, like when Kalin had been taken, he hated magic and wished never again to have anything to do with it. Those devoted to the teachings of the Imperial Order would find cynical satisfaction at such cold thoughts about magic coming from the Lord Rawl. Despite having grown up unaware of magic, Richard had since come to learn a few things about it. For one, he knew that the grace drawn under Nietzsche was a powerful device used by those with the gift. He also knew that drawing it in blood was something that was rarely done, and even then in only the gravest of circumstances. As he glanced at the glistening lines of blood that made up the form of the grace, Richard noticed something that made the hair at the back of his neck stand on end. One of Nietzsche's feet was poised over the center of the grace, the part representing the Creator's light, from where emanated not only life, but the rays that represented the gift that passed through life, the veil, and then on into the eternity of the underworld. Nietzsche's other foot, however, was frozen mere inches above the table beyond the outer ring of the drawing, over the part representing the underworld. Nietzsche hung suspended between the world of life and the world of the dead. Richard knew that such a thing was hardly trivial happenstance. He focused beyond the startling sight of Nietzsche floating in midair 
and in the shadows beyond saw Nathan and Anne occasionally illuminated by the flashes of lightning. Like ghosts, flickering in and out of existence, they too solemnly watched Nietzsche in the center of the glowing spell form. Zed, one hand on a bony hip, his other running a slender finger down his smooth jaw, slowly moved around the table, observing the ever-growing, ever more intricate pattern of glowing green lines. Outside, through the tall windows, lightning continued to flash in harsh fits, but the rumble of thunder was muted by the thick stone of the keep. Richard gazed up at Nietzsche's face. Is she... is she all right? Zed looked over as if he had forgotten that Richard had entered the room. What? Is she all right? Zed's bushy brows drew together. How would I know? Richard threw his arms up and let them flop down in dumbfounded alarm. Well, for crying out loud, Zed, aren't you the one who put her there? Not exactly, Zed muttered, rubbing his palms together as he moved on. Richard stepped closer to the table below Nietzsche. What's going on? Is Nietzsche all right? Is she in danger? Zed finally looked back and sighed. We don't exactly know for sure, my boy. Nathan came out of the shadows and toward the table into the greenish light. The tall prophet's dark azure eyes were clearly troubled. He opened his hands in a gesture of reassurance, his long white hair brushing his shoulders as he shrugged slightly. We think she is all right, Richard. She should be fine, Anne assured him as she joined Nathan. The broad-shouldered prophet towered over her. In her plain woolen dress, with her graying hair gathered back into a loose bun, she looked all the more plain beside Nathan. Richard thought that just about anyone would probably look plain beside Nathan. Richard gestured, indicating the net of geometric lines that encased Nietzsche. What is this thing? A verification web, his grandfather said. Richard frowned. Verification? Verification of what? Chain fire, Zed told him in a somber voice. We're trying to figure out precisely how a chain fire event functions so that we can see if there is a way to reverse it. Richard scratched his temple. Oh. He was liking the whole thing less and less. He desperately wanted to find Kalin, yet he was deeply worried for what could happen to Nietzsche in such an attempt to unravel mysterious powers created by ancient wizards. As first wizard, Zed had abilities and talents that Richard could not begin to fathom, and yet those wizards in ancient times far surpassed Zed's gift. With as much as Zed, Nathan, Anne, and Nietzsche knew, as powerful as they all were, they were still dabbling with things outside their experience, things beyond their ability, things that even those ancient wizards feared. Still... What choice did they have? Besides caring deeply for Nietzsche, Richard needed her to help him find Kalin. While the others might in some areas be more powerful or more knowledgeable than Nietzsche, the sum of everything about her put her on a different plane. She was probably the most powerful sorceress ever to have drawn a breath. What others could do with a great effort, Nietzsche could do with a glance. As remarkable as that was, to Richard, that was probably one of the least remarkable things about Nietzsche. Other than Kalin, he didn't know anyone who could focus on a goal as tenaciously as Nietzsche. Kara could be just as unflinching about defending him, but Nietzsche was able to center that kind of tenacity on anything she set her mind to. Back when she had fought against him, her reckless determination made her not just brutally effective, but profoundly dangerous. Richard was glad all that had changed. Since the search for Kalin had begun, Nietzsche had become his closest and most steadfast friend. Nietzsche knew, though, that his heart belonged to Kalin, and that could never change.
page 42. He raked his fingers back through his hair. Well, why is she up there in the middle of the thing? She's the only one of us who knows how to use subtractive magic, Anne said in simple summary. A chain fire event needs subtractive elements to ignite it and then to make it function. We're trying to understand the whole spell, both the additive and subtractive components. Richard supposed that made sense, but it still didn't make him feel any better about it. And Nietzsche agreed to this? Nathan cleared his throat. It was her idea. Of course it was. Richard sometimes thought the woman had a death wish. It was times like this that he wished he knew more about such things. He was feeling ignorant again. He gestured up at the totality of everything floating above the table, I never realized that verification webs used people. I mean, I never knew that such webs were cast around someone like that. Neither did we, exactly, Nathan said in that deep, commanding voice of his. Richard felt uncomfortable under the prophet's gaze, so he turned to Zed. What do you mean? Zed shrugged. This is the first time any of us has ever done an aspect analysis of a verification web from an interior perspective. To do so requires subtractive magic. So casting a verification web in this manner probably hasn't been done in perhaps thousands of years. Then how did you know how to do it? Just because none of us has ever done such a thing, Anne said, doesn't mean we haven't studied various accounts of it. Zed gestured to one of the other tables. We've been reading the book you found, Chain Fire. It's more complex than anything any of us has ever seen before, so we wanted to try to understand everything about it. While we've never done an interior perspective before, it's really just an extension of what we already know. As long as you know how to run a standard verification web, and you have the required elements of the gift, you can perform the aspect analysis from an interior perspective. That's what Nietzsche is doing. That's why she had to be the one to do it. If there's a standard process, then why would this method be needed? Zed lifted a hand toward the lines around Nietzsche. An interior perspective is said to show the spell form in more revealing detail, down to a more elemental level, than you see in the standard verification process. Since it is said to show more than can be learned in the standard process, and Nietzsche was able to initiate it, we all decided that it would be an advantage to do it this way. Richard was starting to breathe a little easier. So then using Nietzsche in this way is just an abstract analysis. It means nothing more. Zed looked away from Richard's eyes as he lightly rubbed the furrows on his brow. This is only a verification process, Richard, not an ignition of the actual event. So, in a sense, it's not real. What the real spell does in an instant this inert form stretches out into a lengthy verification process so as to enable a comprehensive analysis. Although not without its risks, that's not the viable spell itself you see around Nietzsche. Zed cleared his throat. When the actual spell would have been cast, though, instead of Nietzsche, that would have been Kalen, and it would have been all too real. Goosebumps ran up Richard's arms. His mouth felt so dry that he could hardly talk. He could feel his heart pounding through the veins in his neck. He wanted that not to be true. But you said that you needed Nietzsche in order to cast this web. You said that you could only do it because she can work subtractive magic. Kalen wouldn't have been able to do that for the sisters, and in any event, she wouldn't have cooperated. Zed shook his head. The sisters were casting the real spell around Kalen. They had command of subtractive power and would have no need for Kalen's cooperation. 
we needed Nietzsche to work it from inside, using both additive and subtractive aspects, so that we can try to determine how it functions. The two aren't analogous. Well, how... Richard, his grandfather said, gently cutting him off, as I said, we're rather busy. Right now is not the time to discuss this. We need to observe the process so we can try to figure out the equational behavior of the spell. Let us do our job, will you? Richard slipped his hands into his back pockets. Sure. He glanced back at Kara. She wore what people might see as a blank expression, but to Richard, as well as he knew her, it revealed a great deal and seemed to reflect his own suspicions. He turned back to his grandfather. Are you having some kind of trouble? Zed cast the others a sidelong glance and only grunted before turning back to study the geometric forms surrounding the woman floating before him. Richard knew his grandfather well enough to know by his drawn features that he was either unhappy or very worried. Richard didn't think that either prospect augured well. He began to worry himself for Nietzsche. As the others stood back to take it all in, frowning in concentration as they pondered the way the glowing verification web continued to trace new lines through space, Richard stepped closer. He slowly walked around the table, finally studying, for the first time really, the lines crisscrossing through the air all around Nietzsche. As he moved in closer and stepped around the table, he realized that the lines actually formed a cylinder in space, like something flat that had been rolled up with Nietzsche inside that cylinder. That meant that all the lines were simply a two-dimensional drawing, even if they did wrap around until they met. Richard mentally flattened out that cylindrical form, much like unrolling a scroll in order to see it in his mind as a more customary line drawing. When he did so, he began to realize that there was something oddly familiar about the network of lines. The more Richard studied it, the more he couldn't stop staring at it, as if it were pulling him in, drawing him into the pattern of lines, angles, and arcs. There seemed to be something he should recognize about it all, but he couldn't figure out what. He thought that perhaps he should regard a spell form that had been cast around Kalen, as this terrible thing had been, to be evil. But he didn't feel that way. The spell form existed. It did not possess the quality of being good or evil. The ones who cast the web around Kalen were the real evil. Those four sisters were the ones who had used the spell for their own evil ends. They had used it as part of their plan to have the boxes of Orden and to free the Keeper from the underworld, to lose death on the living, all in return for beguiling promises of immortality. Gazing at the lines, Richard began to scrutinize the rhythm in those lines, their patterns, their flow. As he did so, he began to get an inkling of their significance. He was beginning to see purpose in the design. Richard pointed to a space near Nietzsche's extended right arm just below her elbow. This place here is wrong, he said, as he frowned into the fabric woven of light. Zed came to a halt. Wrong? Richard hadn't realized that he'd said it out loud, at least not loud enough for others to hear. Yes, that's right. It's wrong. Chapter 5 Richard went back to studying the lines, tilting his head to better follow them along as they went through a complex intersection of roots coming around from all directions to end up before Nietzsche's middle. He was beginning to grasp the meaning of those roots and the larger intent of the design. I think there's a supporting structure missing. He aimed a finger off to his left. It seems like it should have started back there, don't you think? It looks like this place here should have a line going up this way and then back to that spot near her elbow. His attention riveted on the rhythm of things. Richard was largely lost to the rest of the room. 
It's impossible for you to know such a thing, Anne said flatly. He wasn't discouraged by her skepticism. When someone shows you a circle and it has a flat spot in it, you know it's wrong, don't you? You can see the intended design and know that the flat spot doesn't belong there. Richard, this is not some simple circle. You don't even know what you're looking at. She caught herself before her voice rose any more, clasped her hands before herself, and took a deep breath before going on. I'm simply trying to point out that there are a great deal of complexities involved here that you are not aware of. The three of us haven't even begun to be able to unravel the mechanism behind the spell form, and we have extensive training in such things. Despite our training and knowledge, it's still far from complete enough for us to grasp the manner in which it functions. You don't understand the first thing about such complex motifs. Without turning to her, Richard flicked a hand to dismiss her concern. Doesn't matter. The form is emblematic. Nathan cocked his head. It's what? Emblematic, Richard murmured as he studied an intersection of lines, trying to identify the primary strand through the architecture of the lineation. So, his grandfather sputtered after Richard again fell to silent preoccupation, I understand the jargon of emblems, he said absently, as he found the primary thread and traced it along a rise and fall and swirl of the pattern, all the time coming more in tune with its intent. I told you that before. When? Back when we were with the mud people. Richard immersed himself in the flow of the design, trying to perceive the ascendant course among the lesser branches. Kalen was there, so was Anne. I'm afraid that we don't remember, Zed admitted, after seeing Anne shake her head in frustration. He sighed unhappily. Yet one more memory surrounding Kalen lost to us because of what those sisters did. Richard didn't really hear him. Growing ever more agitated, he waggled a finger back and forth at a breach in the lines just below Nietzsche's elbow. I'm telling you, there's a line missing here. I'm sure of it. Richard turned to his grandfather. He saw then that everyone was staring at him. Right here, he told them as he pointed again. From the end of this upward rising arc to this intersection of triangles, there should be a line. Zed frowned. A line? Yes. He didn't know why they hadn't spotted it before. It was stone-cold obvious to Richard, like a song sung with a note of the melody left out. A line is missing, an important line. Important, Anne repeated in weary exasperation. Richard, becoming more unsettled by the moment, wiped a hand across his mouth. Very important. Zed sighed. Richard, what are you talking about? There is no way you could know such a thing, Anne scoffed, her patience wearing thinner by the moment. Look, Richard said, turning back to them, it's an emblem, a design. Zed scratched the back of his head, glancing briefly to the window as a particularly violent fit of lightning flared so close that it released a crack of thunder that felt like it might loosen the stone walls of the keep. He turned back to Richard. And the design tells you something, Richard? Yes. Such a design is like a translation from another language. In a way, it's what you're trying to understand by doing this verification web. This form characterizes a concept in much the same way that a math equation expresses physical attributes, such as an equation expressing the ratio of the circumference of a circle to the diameter. Emblematic forms can be a kind of language, too, the way mathematics is a form of language. They both are able to reveal something about the nature of things. Zed patiently smoothed back his hair. You see emblems as a form of language? In a way. Take the grace underneath Nietzsche, for example. That's an emblem. The outer circle represents the beginning of the underworld, while the inner circle represents the limits of the world of life. 
The square separating them represents the veil between those worlds. In the center is an eight-pointed star representing the Creator's light. The eight lines radiating out from the points of that star all the way out through the outer circle represent the gift carried from creation all the way through life across the veil and beyond into death. The whole thing is an emblem. When you see that emblem, you see it as a whole concept. You might say that you understand the language of it. If during the casting of a spell, someone with the gift doesn't draw the grace correctly, hasn't spoken the language correctly, it won't work as intended and might even cause trouble. Say you saw a grace with a nine-pointed star or with one of the circles missing. Wouldn't you know it was wrong? If the square representing the veil was drawn incorrectly, then under the right circumstances, it could even theoretically breach the veil and allow the worlds to bleed together. It's an emblem. You understand the concept it represents. You know what it should look like. If it's drawn wrong, then you recognize it as wrong. When the flashes of lightning flickered to a stop, the room felt forsaken in the weak light of lamps. Distant thunder rumbled ominously up from the valley below. Zed, standing stock still, studied Richard with more focus than he had been studying the verification web. I've never looked at it in quite that way before, Richard, but I grant that you might have a point. Nathan arched a brow. He certainly does. Anne sighed. Perhaps. Richard turned from their dour expressions back to the glowing lines. This, right here, he said, gesturing, is wrong. Zed stretched his neck to peer at the lines. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, that you're right. What do you think it means? Richard's heart hammered as he made his way around the table, swiftly tracing lines through the spell. He used a finger, keeping it just clear of the lines of light to track the primary pathways, the sweeps of the pattern, the fabric of the form. He found what he was expecting. Here. Look here. At this newly formed structure that has built up around these older original lines. Look at the disordered nature of this new cluster. They're a variable, but in this emblem of lines, it should all be a constant. Variable, Zed sputtered, as if having thought he was following Richard's reasoning, had instead suddenly found that he was completely lost. Yes, Richard said. It's not emblematic. It's a biological form. The two are completely different. Nathan wiped both hands back over his white hair as he sighed but remained silent. Anne's face had gone crimson. It's a spell form. It's inert. It can't be biological. That's the problem, Richard said, answering her point rather than her anger. You can't have these kinds of variables tainting what's supposed to be a constant. It would be like a math equation in which any of the numbers could spontaneously change their value. Such a thing would render math invalid and unworkable. Algebraic symbols can vary, but even then they are specific relational variables. The numbers, though, are constants. Same with this structure. Emblems have to be constructed of inert constants. You might say, like simple addition or subtraction. An internal variable corrupts the constant of an emblematic form. I don't follow, Zed admitted. Richard gestured to the table. You drew the grace in blood. The grace is a constant. The blood is biological. Why did you do it that way? To make it work, Anne snapped. We had to do it that way in order to initiate an interior perspective of the verification web. That's the way it's done. That's the method. Richard held up a finger. Exactly. You deliberately introduced a controlled biological variable, blood, into what is a constant, a grace. Keep in mind, though, that it remains outside the spell form itself. It's merely an empowering agent, a catalyst. 
I think it must be that such a variable in the grace allows the spell you initiated to run its course without being influenced by a constant, the grace. Do you see? It gives the verification web not only the power invoked by the grace, but the freedom gained through the biological variable to allow it to grow as it needs to in order to reveal its true nature and intent. When Zed glanced her way, Kara said, Don't look at me. Whenever he starts in like this, I just nod and smile and wait until the trouble starts. Zed made a sour face. One hand on a hip, he took a few paces away before turning back. I've never in all my years heard such an explanation of a verification web. It's quite a unique way of looking at it. The most troubling thing is that, in a perverse way, it actually makes sense. I'm not saying that I think you're right, Richard, but it certainly is a disturbing notion. If you're right, Nathan said, it would mean that we've been children playing with fire all these years. That's if he's right, Anne added under her breath. Sounds a tick too clever to me. Richard stared up at the woman frozen in space, the woman who could not at the moment speak for herself. Whose blood did you use to draw the grace? He asked the others behind him. Nietzsche's, Nathan said. She suggested it herself. She said it was the proper method and the only way to make it work. Richard turned to them. Nietzsche's. You used Nietzsche's blood? Zed nodded. That's right. You created a variable with her blood and you put her inside of it? Besides being what Nietzsche told us had to be done, Anne said, we have a lot of research and reason to have confidence that this is the proper method of initiating an interior perspective. I'm sure you're right, under normal circumstances. Since you all know the proper method for doing such things, then that can only mean that the corruption is far different than any ordinary problem that could be anticipated to arise in the verification process. Richard raked his fingers back through his hair. It would have to be something... I don't know. Something unimaginable. Zed shrugged. You really believe that having Nietzsche in there when she was the source of the blood to power the web could mean something troublesome, Richard? Richard pinched his lower lip as he paced. Maybe not if the originating spell form you were verifying were pure, but this one isn't. It's contaminated by another biological variable. I think that providing the source of the control variable, Nietzsche, might allow the contamination all the latitude it needs. Meaning? Nathan asked. Richard gestured as he paced, meaning that it's like throwing oil on a fire. I think the storm is letting our imaginations get carried away, Anne said. What biological variable could possibly contaminate a verification web? Nathan asked. Richard turned back and stared at the lines, following them around to that terrible arc that ended where it should be supported. He glanced across the empty space to the waiting intersection. I don't know, he finally admitted. Zed stepped closer. Richard, your ideas are original, and they are certainly thought-provoking, I'll grant you that. And it could be that they may provide us useful insights to help us understand more than we otherwise might have. But not everything you say is correct. Some of it is simply wrong. Richard glanced back over his shoulder. Really? Like what? Zed shrugged. Well, for one thing, biological forms can be emblematic as well. Is not an oak leaf biological? Don't you recognize that emblematic form? Isn't a snake something that can be expressed with an emblem? Isn't a whole entity, say a tree or a man, able to be represented emblematically? Richard blinked. You're right. I never thought of it that way, but you're right. He turned back to the spell form, 
viewing the area of biological contamination with new eyes. He scanned the confusing mass, trying to make sense of it, trying to discern a pattern. Try as he might, though, it seemed useless. There was no pattern. But why not? If its delineation was biological in origin, as he knew it was, then, according to Zed, there should be some kind of source pattern expressed within that depiction. But there was none. It was nothing more than a confusing mass, all tangled up in a nest of meaningless lines. And then he realized that he thought he recognized a small portion within that mass, it looked somehow liquid. But that made no sense, because he saw another part that looked almost the opposite. That other fragment looked more like an emblematic representation of fire, unless there was more than one element to it. A tree could have an oak leaf emblem, an acorn, or the form that represented the whole tree. And what was to say that it couldn't be three different things all contaminating the spell form together. Three things. He saw them then, each of those three elements. Water, fire, air. They were all there, all tangled together. Dear spirits, Richard whispered, his eyes going wide. He straightened, goosebumps tangled up his arms. Get her out of there. Richard, Nathan said, she's perfectly... Get her out of there. Get her out now. Richard, Anne started, I told you the spell form has a flaw. Well, that's what we're trying to find out now, isn't it? Anne said with exaggerated patience. You don't understand, Richard gestured toward the wall of softly glowing lines. This isn't the kind of flaw that anyone would be looking for. This one will kill her. The spell is no longer inert. It's mutating. It's becoming viable. Viable? Zed's expression twisted with incredulity. How could you possibly... You have to get her out of there. Get her out now. Chapter 6 Although she couldn't move, couldn't speak, Nietzsche was aware of everything that was being said, even if the voices sounded hollow, distant, temporal, as if coming from some faraway world beyond the greenish shroud. She wanted to scream, listen to him, but held tightly as she was within the bosom of the casting, she could not. More than anything, she wanted out of the terrible tangle of crushing power that encased her. She hadn't understood the true meaning of an interior perspective before. None of them had. None of them could have guessed at the reality. Only after initiating the process had she discovered that such a perspective was not simply a way to view a verification web in more detail from the inside, as they had thought, but rather a means for the person doing the analysis to experience it within themselves. By then it was too late, and she could not tell the others that what it meant was that she would be perceiving the spell form by having it ignited within her. The part surrounding her was the mere aura of the conjured power that had dawned within her. It had at first been a revelation bordering on the divine. Not long after they had initiated it, though, something had begun to go wrong. What had been a profoundly beautiful form of vision had deteriorated into horrific agony. Every new line that sliced through space around her had a corresponding interior aspect that felt as if it were slashing through her soul. In the beginning, she had discovered that pleasure was part of the mechanism by which one perceived the spell as it unfolded, in much the same way in which pleasure could confirm wholesome, fitting aspects of life it likewise revealed the intricate nature of the spell form in all its glory. It felt like watching a particularly beautiful sunrise, or tasting a delightful confection, or gazing into the eyes of someone you loved and having them gaze back in the same way. Or at least 
It was like what she imagined it would feel like to have them gaze back in that way. She had also discovered that, as in life, pain pointed out grievous disorders. Nietzsche would never have guessed that such a method had once been commonly used to analyze the inner functioning of a constructed magic, of gauging its inner health. She would never have guessed the complexity or extent of what the method could reveal. She would never have guessed how much it could hurt when something within the spell went awry. She wondered if she would still have insisted on doing such a thing had she known. She guessed that she would have, if it had a chance of helping Richard. At that moment, though, there was little else that mattered to her but the pain. It was beyond anything she had ever experienced. Not even the dream walker himself had been able to give her this much pain. It was almost impossible for her to think of anything but her want of being free from the agony. So great was the magnitude of the taint within the spell that there was no doubt in her mind that experiencing it would for her be fatal. Richard had shown them the place it had begun to go wrong. He had pointed out the fundamental defect. That contamination concealed within the spell was pulling her apart. She could feel her life bleeding away beyond that terrible outer circle of the grace. That grace, drawn with her blood, had become her life, and it would be her death. For the moment, Nietzsche straddled two worlds, neither of them wholly real to her. While still in the world of life, she could feel herself inexorably slipping into that dark void beyond. All the while, the world of life around her was losing its vibrance. She was, at that moment, willing to let it all go, to let herself slip forever into the eternity of non-existence, if only it would mean that the pain would end. Even though she could not move, Nietzsche could see everything in the room, not with her eyes, but with her gift. Even beyond the suffering, she recognized such an exotic form of sight as an extraordinary experience. Vision, through her gift alone, had a singular quality that approached omniscience. She could see more than her eyes had ever allowed her to see. Despite her agony, there was a quiet majesty to it all. Beyond the net of greenish lines, Richard looked from one startled face to another. What's the matter with all of you? You have to get her out of there. Before Anne could launch into a lecture, Zed gestured for her to keep quiet. Once sure her lips would stay pressed tightly together, he turned his attention back to his grandson. Another line departed an intersection and traced a path through space. It felt to Nietzsche like a dull knitting needle taking a stitch in her soul, pulling the agony of that thread of light through her as it bound her ever more tightly to a dark death. It was all she could do to remain conscious. Surrender was seeming sweeter by the moment. Zed gestured up toward her. We can't, Richard. These things have to run a course. The verification web runs itself through a series of connections and in that way reveals information about its nature. Once the verification process has begun, it's impossible to halt it. It has to run its course to completion and then it extinguishes. Nietzsche knew the grim truth of it. Richard seized his grandfather's arm. How long? He shook the old man like a rag doll. How long does the process take? Zed pried Richard's fingers off his arm. We've never seen a spell like this. It's hard to say. But as complex as it's proving to be, I can't imagine it taking less than three or four hours. She's been in there an hour already, so it will be hours yet before it runs its course and extinguishes. Nietzsche knew that she didn't have hours. She had mere moments before the pull of the contamination drew her forever beyond the veil and into the world of the dead. 
She thought it a strange way for her life to end. So unexpected, so uneventful, so pointless. She would at least have wanted it to be an end that in some way would have helped Richard, or to have been after they knew that they had accomplished something. She wished her death could have at least bought him something of value. Richard turned back to gaze up at her. She won't last that long. We have to get her out of there now. Inwardly, through her agony, she smiled. To the end, Richard would fight to the end against death. Richard, Zed said, I can't imagine how you could possibly know such a thing, and I'm not saying that I don't believe you, but we can't shut down a verification web. Why not? Well, Zed said as he sighed, the truth is I don't even know if such a thing is possible. But even if it were, none of us knows how to do it. The standard verification process builds safeguards to shield itself from tampering. This thing is an order of magnitude more complex and involved. Rather like trying to dismount in mid-gallop while racing along a ridge line, the tall prophet said. You need to wait until the horse is finished running before you jump off, or you will only be leaping to your death. Richard returned to the table, frantically studying the structure constructed of light. Nietzsche wondered if he realized that, while it was to a degree tangible, what he was seeing existed mainly as a mere aura representing the real power raging through her. As another line advanced from an intersection at an angle that was dreadfully wrong, Nietzsche gasped inwardly. She felt something vital within her being slowly ripped open. The pain of it sang through the marrow of her bones. She saw darkness layered over the room and knew she was seeing into another world, the dark world where there would be no more pain. She began to allow herself to drift toward that world. And then she saw something in the otherworldly shadows. She caught herself, held herself back from the dark brink of death. Something with glowing eyes, like twin coals, gazed out from the dark shadows. The malevolent intent of that furnace gaze was fixed on Richard. Nietzsche struggled desperately to call out a warning. It cleaved her heart that she could not. Look, Richard whispered as he gazed up at her. There's a tear running down her cheek. Anne sadly shook her head. Probably because she isn't blinking, that's all. Richard's hands fisted in frustration as he moved around the table trying to decipher the meaning of the lines. We have to find a way to shut the thing down. There has to be a way. Richard's grandfather laid a hand gently on the back of Richard's shoulder. I swear, Richard, I would do as you want if I could, but I know of no method to halt a verification web. And what is it that has you so fired up anyway? Why the sudden urgency? What is it that you think is contaminating the spell form? Nietzsche's attention was locked on the thing watching out of the shadowy world of the dead. Whenever the lightning flared, illuminating the room, the thing with the glowing eyes wasn't there. Only when darkness again fell over the room could she see it. Richard's eyes turned from studying the lines to gaze up at Nietzsche's face. She wanted nothing so much as for him to reach out and pull her free of the agony of the spell that had impaled her on lethal shards of magic, but she knew that he could not. Right then, she would have willingly given up her life for one moment in his arms. Richard's answer finally came in a soft resignation. The chimes. Anne rolled her eyes. Nathan let out a sigh of relief as if he now knew that Richard was merely imagining things. Zed's brow lifted. The chimes? Richard, I'm afraid that this time you've gotten it wrong. That simply isn't possible. The chimes are underworld elements. 
While they certainly lust to enter our world, they can't. They're forever trapped in the underworld. I know very well what the chimes are, Richard said in a near whisper. Kaylin freed them. She freed them to save my life. She couldn't possibly know how to do such a thing. Nathan told her how, told her their names, Richani, Sintrosi, Vasi, water, fire, air. Calling them was the only way for her to save my life. It was an act of desperation. Nathan's mouth fell open in surprise, but he offered no argument. Anne cast a suspicious glare up at the prophet. Zed spread his hands. Richard, she may have thought she was calling them, but I assure you, such a thing is monumentally complex. Besides, we would know if the chimes were free in our world. Be at ease about this much of it. The chimes are not loose. Not anymore, Richard said with grim finality. I banished them back to the underworld. But Kalen always believed that because she unknowingly brought them into our world, it had engendered the beginning of the destruction of magic itself, the cascade effect, as you once described it to us. Zed was taken aback. The cascade effect? You could only have heard that from me. Richard nodded as he stared off into memories. She tried to convince me that magic had been tainted by the presence of the chimes, and that banishing them back to the underworld would not halt that taint. I never knew whether or not she was right. Now I do. He pointed up at that awful place before Nietzsche, that core of her pain, her agony, her end. There is the proof. Not the chimes, but the corruption their presence caused. The contamination of magic. That contamination has infected this world. It was drawn to the strength of this magic. It has infected the chainfire spell, and it will kill Nietzsche if we don't get her out of there. The room had grown darker yet. Nietzsche could hardly see through the veil of pain, but she could still see those sinister eyes behind Richard in the shadows, watching, waiting. No one but Nietzsche knew that it was there, in that spectral place between worlds. Richard would never know what hit him. Nietzsche had no way to warn him. She felt another tear roll down her face. Richard, seeing that tear drip from her jaw, leaned close. With quiet determination, he used a finger to trace the primary pathways, the supporting junctures, and the main framework of the emblem, as he called it. It should be feasible, he insisted. Anne looked beside herself, but she remained silent. Nathan watched with stony resignation. Zed pushed his simple robes farther up his bony arms. Richard, it's impossible to shut down a regular verification web, much less one such as this. No, it's not, Richard said irritably. Here. See here? You have to interrupt this route here first. Bags, Richard, how am I supposed to do such a thing? The spell shields itself. This web is powered by subtractive as well as additive magic. It has integral shields constructed of both. Richard stared at his grandfather's crimson face a moment before turning back to the maze of lines. He gazed up at Nietzsche again, and then carefully inserted a hand in through the net of lines to touch Nietzsche's black dress. I won't let it have you, he whispered to her. No words had ever sounded sweeter, even if she knew he could not understand the impossibility of his promise. When his finger touched her dress, the patterns shifted from two-dimensional to three-dimensional forms that looked more like a thorn bush than a spell form. It felt to Nietzsche as if he had just twisted a knife through her insides. She struggled to remain conscious. She focused on the glowing eyes in the shadows. She had to find a way to warn Richard. His hand paused. He carefully pulled it back out. The pattern flattened to two-dimensional. 
Nietzsche would have sighed in relief could she breathe. Did you see that? he asked. Zed nodded. I certainly did. Richard glanced back over his shoulder at his grandfather. Is it supposed to do that? No. I didn't think so. It's supposed to be inert. But the biological variable contaminating it has changed the nature of the host spell form. Zed's expression tightened as he considered. It seems pretty obvious that whatever is going on, it's changing the way the spell works. Richard nodded. Worse, it's a random variable. The contamination caused by the chime's presence in this world is biological. It evolves, probably so that it can attack different kinds of magic. This spell will undoubtedly continue to mutate. There's probably no way to predict how it will change, but from the evidence here, it appears that it's only going to become more virulent. As if chain fire isn't trouble enough, this could make it worse. It could even be that everyone affected by it will develop problems beyond their memory loss revolving around Kalen. What makes you say that? Zed asked. Just look at how many memories of events only tangent to Kalen you've all lost. The lost memories could even be the means by which the contamination infects those people touched by the effects of the chain fire event. As if the chain fire event being loosed on the world weren't potentially deadly enough, it now seemed catastrophic beyond imagining. Anne was bottled fury. She gritted her teeth. Where did you learn such gibberish? Zed flashed her a scowl. Be quiet. I told you, I understand emblematic designs. This one is a mess. Nathan glanced to the windows as they lit with flashes of lightning. When the room again fell to darkness, Nietzsche could again see the thing watching from a dark world. And you sincerely believe that it's somehow harming Nietzsche? Zed asked. I know it is. Look at this divergence right here. Such a thing is lethal even without this added breach over here. I know a lot about representational designs involving lethality. Zed gave Richard a forbidding look. I need to know what you're talking about. What you mean by representational designs involving lethality. Later, we have to get her out of there first. And we have to get her out now. Zed shook his head in resignation. I wish I knew a way, Richard, I truly do. But as I've said, I don't. If you try to pull her out of there before the verification has run its course, that alone will kill her for sure. That much I do know. Why? Because her life is in a way suspended. Don't you see that she isn't breathing? The spell form surrounding her supports her life while she cannot, while the web runs through the verification. She is, in a way, now a part of the spell itself. Pull her out, and you will be pulling her out of the mechanism that is keeping her alive. Nietzsche's heart sank. For a moment, she had begun to believe Richard, to believe that he could do it. It was not to be. All the while, the glowing eyes watched. She could see the shape of it now, standing there in the dark shadows beside a tall shelf. It looked something like a man twisted into a fearsome beast of sinew and knotted muscle. Its eyes gleamed out from the darkness of death itself. It was the beast that hunted Richard, the beast sent by Jagang, the dreamwalker. She would have done anything to stop it, to keep it from Richard, but she could not move a muscle. With every new line of sight, she was being stitched tighter and tighter to her fate, pulled inexorably into the darkness of eternity beyond life. Even if it's mutating, Richard said, as if thinking aloud, it still has elements that support it while it grows. Richard, a verification web is self-generating. Even if it was mutating like you say, there is no way to halt such an event. If it can be shut down, Richard murmured, it will release her. 
then we won't be pulling her out of it while her life is still being supported by the spell. Sighing, Zed shook his head as if he thought Richard hadn't understood a thing he'd said. Richard studied the lines one last time, then abruptly reached out and placed his finger at an intersection that had been created back before the area of contamination. The line extinguished at his finger. Dear spirits, Nathan said as he leaned in. The shadow took a step forward. Nietzsche could now see its fangs. The line that had extinguished felt as if it pulled her insides out with it. Nietzsche fought to cling to life. If he really could do it, if he really could extinguish the spell, she had a chance to warn him. If she could hold on that long... Richard withdrew his finger. The line ignited again. It lanced through her like a razor-sharp spear. The world flickered. See? Zed reached out to duplicate what Richard had done, but with a yelp of pain, pulled his hand back as if he'd been burned. It's shielded with subtractive magic, Anne said. Zed shot her a murderous scowl. And remember the shields back at the Palace of the Prophets? Richard asked her. Remember how I was able to pass through them? Anne nodded. I still have nightmares about it. Richard reached out again, quickly this time, and again blocked the line of light. Again it extinguished. Richard then put a finger from his other hand at an intersection preceding the darkened line. In a blink, more lines went dark. He moved his first finger to insert it at another key point, working his way back through the pattern, causing the spell to turn in on itself. The darkened line raced around Nietzsche, hitting intersections, making turns, sweeping through and darkening arcs. The line Richard had extinguished ceased to exist in the pattern, its absence causing an interruption in the vitality of the rhythm. Nietzsche marveled at the reaction of the spell form within her. She could sense in detail the process of it dismantling, like a flower closing its petals. The room again seemed to shimmer in Nietzsche's gifted vision, as if lightning were flaring, but she knew that this was not lightning. The glowing eyes peered about, as if it, too, sensed the fluctuation in the flux of power Richard had interrupted. Didn't anyone but Nietzsche realize that Richard was using his gift to penetrate such shields? Were they blind? The use of his gift drew the beast out of the underworld. Outside, real lightning flashed and thunder boomed. The room flickered not only with the lightning, but with the disruption of power within the spell form. The wall of windows flashed between blinding brightness and inky obscurity. It felt to Nietzsche as if both of those powerful discharges thundered right through her. She could not understand how she was still alive. It could only be that Richard was shutting down the spell without destroying it. He was methodically extinguishing it, like snuffing out the flames on a row of wicks. Focused in concentration, Richard put his other hand down lower and blocked another line. The line went dark racing back through the complex matrix. The shadow of the beast began to step out of the underworld, partially into the world of life, pulling and flexing its arms with the difficulty of the task, testing its newborn muscle. Fangs glistened in the lamplight as the jaws stretched wide. Their attention riveted on the lines around Nietzsche, no one noticed. Holding a block in one network of lines, Richard carefully inserted a finger to occlude a preceding framework. The entire web, having lost not just its most important supporting structure, but its very integrity, began to come apart. Angles opened, intersections disjointed, letting connecting lines sag away. Other lines collided, sparking flashes of white light upon contact that made yet more lines go dark. All of a sudden, the web of remaining lines collapsed downward like a curtain falling. Nietzsche could feel the network of power laced all through her slough away. 
As the falling lines of light hit the grace, they went dark. In an instant, they were gone. Free from the tangle, Nietzsche abruptly dropped to the table as she gasped a breath like a scream drawn inward. Her legs had no strength to hold her, and she crumpled, toppling over the edge of the table. Richard caught her in his arms as she fell. Her dead weight took him to one knee. He maintained his balance, cradling her in his arms, saving her from hitting the stone floor. Outside, lightning went wild, casting the room in fits of flickering light. It was then that the beast, a soulless creature created for a single purpose, materialized fully out of the world of the dead and into the world of life, and sprang straight for Richard. Chapter 7 Hanging limp and helpless in Richard's arms, despite how much she tried, Nietzsche simply could not bring forth enough strength to warn him of the beast about to crash down on him. She would have given her last breath to deliver that warning, but right then she had no breath. It was Kara throwing all her weight at the charging creature who deflected the full force of the attack and saved Richard from a killing strike. The beast's fangs caught only air as it crashed past Richard, but its claws ripped through the flesh at the back of his shoulder. Knocked off balance from Kara's tackle, the beast stumbled past Richard and smashed headlong into one of the heavy shelves. Bones, books, and boxes tumbled down. The thing scrambled to its feet, snarling, fangs bared, muscles taut. Stretching for a moment to its full height, it was a good foot taller than Richard, and its shoulders were nearly twice as wide. Bony projections marked its hunched spine. Dark, leathery flesh, like that of a desiccated corpse, covered powerful muscles. It was a creature that wasn't really alive, and yet it moved and reacted as if it were. Nietzsche knew that it had no soul, and for that reason it was all the more dangerous. It had been conjured in part from the lives and Han, the gift, of living men. It acted with the single-minded purpose that had been instilled in it by its creators, Jagang's Sisters of the Dark. As it immediately recovered and again went for Richard, Kara lashed out with her Aegeel. The beast didn't appear to be harmed in the least by the weapon, but it abruptly halted and twisted toward the moored Sith with shocking speed and strength, backhanding her hard enough to send her flying. She crashed into a bookcase, toppling it back. Kara didn't rise from the jumble of books and splintered wood. As lightning flashed outside the tall windows, Zed used the opening to thrust out a hand, unleashing a shimmering bolt of power that lit the room. Shards of white-hot light exploded against the dark hide of the beast's chest, leaving lines of soot radiating outward as evidence of the contact that didn't appear to have caused any real harm. Nietzsche, after Richard had laid her on the floor, was just starting to be able to pull desperately needed air into her lungs. She put an elbow out to prop herself up as she gasped for breath. She saw blood running from Richard's shoulder and down his arm. As he rose to meet his attacker, he reached for his sword, but his sword was no longer there at his hip. Slowed for only an instant, he instead drew a knife from a sheath at his belt. As he met the threat racing toward him, he slashed with the blade, making solid contact that sent the creature reeling. Staggered by the blow and knocked from its feet, it tumbled across the stone floor, stopping only when it collided with one of the massive shelves. A ragged flap of leathery flesh hung like a flag from the injured shoulder. Without slowing, without pause, the beast sprang into a somersault and landed on its feet, ready to renew its attack. Anne and Nathan both threw fiery bolts at it. Rather than incinerating it, the conjured flames splashed off the beast. Unharmed, it roared with fury. Flashes of lightning glinted off the razor-sharp blade, poised motionless in Richard's fist. The creature seemed all fangs and claws as it again lunged for him. 
Richard stepped aside, gracefully turning with the beast's onrushing charge, and with a backhanded swing, slammed his knife hilt deep into the center of its chest. It was a perfectly executed strike. Unfortunately, it seemed to have had no more effect than anything else that had been tried. The creature wheeled with impossible speed and seized Richard's wrist. Before it could catch him up in its powerful arms, Richard twisted under the grip and came up behind his attacker. He gritted his teeth with the mighty effort of twisting the creature's powerful arm up behind its knobby back. Nietzsche heard joints pop and bones snap. Rather than the injury slowing the beast, it whirled around, swinging the broken arm like a flail. Richard ducked and rolled away as deadly claws scythed past. Zed used the opening to ignite a sphere of seething liquid fire. Even the lightning seemed to pause in the presence of such profound power brought to life. The room vibrated with the howl of the deadly concentrated inferno Zed unleashed. The knot of churning flames shrieked through the dark room, illuminating the tables and chairs, the shelves and columns, and the faces of everyone watching as it swept past. The beast glanced back over its shoulder at the tumbling, hissing yellow conflagration wailing across the room and defiantly bared its fangs at the approaching fire. It struck Nietzsche as an odd thing for the creature to do, almost as if it didn't fear fire conjured by a wizard. Nietzsche had trouble imagining anything that could withstand such an onslaught or not fear it. This was no mere fire, after all but a menace that burned with phenomenal ferocity. An instant before the writhing sphere of wizard's fire reached its target, the creature simply winked out of existence. Absent an objective, the fire splashed down on the stone floor, exploding across the carpets and breaking over tables like a rogue wave crashing ashore. Although conjured for a specific enemy, Nietzsche knew that runaway wizard's fire could easily annihilate them all. Before it could destroy the room or anyone in it, Zed, Nathan, and Anne immediately cast yet more webs, Zed doing his best to recall his power, while the other two suppressed and smothered the flames before they had a chance to get out of control. Clouds of steam billowed up as they all worked to contain any errant droplets of the tenacious fire. It was a tense moment before they knew that they had succeeded. Beyond the fog of vapor, Nietzsche saw the beast materialize out of the darkness. It appeared behind Zed, back in the shadows where she'd first seen it step into the world of life. Nietzsche was the only one who realized that it had returned in a different place. She had never before seen the creature slip in and out of the world of the dead at will, but she knew that was the method by which it was able to track and follow Richard across vast distances. She knew, too, that no matter the form it took, it would never rest until it had him. Richard spotted the beast coming for him before any of the others and called out a warning to Zed, standing directly in the path of the wild charge. Zed blocked that charge by massing the air itself into a densely compressed angled shield. The trick deflected the beast's course by just enough. Richard used the diversion to slash at his attacker. Before his knife could make contact, the beast again winked out of existence, only to return an instant later once past Richard's blade. It almost seemed to be toying with them, but Nietzsche knew that that wasn't the case. It was merely employing varying tactics in its soulless quest to have Richard. Even its seemingly angry roars were merely a tactic meant to weaken its victim with fear, thereby giving it a chance to strike. Instilling the capacity for emotion in it would have produced limitations. Therefore, Jagang's sisters had left such qualities out. The beast was incapable of actually feeling anger, it was simply unremitting in its purpose. Anne and Nathan released a torrent of power concentrated into thousands of small, rock-hard, deadly points that could have shredded the hide right off an ox. But before the hurtling fragments could rip into the creature, it again effortlessly evaded the attacks by stepping into a shadow 
and coming out once again in another place. Nietzsche realized that none of them had the ability to stop the thing. Struggling to recover her strength, she scrambled across the floor to check on Kara. Still lying against a wall, Kara was dazed and having difficulty regaining her senses. Nietzsche pressed her fingers to the moored Sith's temples, trickling in a thread of magic to wake her and revive her strength. She seized the woman by her leather outfit when she suddenly tried to scramble to her feet. Listen to me, Nietzsche said. If you want to save Richard, you have to listen to me. You can't stop that thing. Not one to take instruction well, especially when it came to protecting Richard, Kara saw the immediate threat and sprang into action. As the beast spun around, focused on Richard, Kara threw herself at it down low, rolling under it, knocking it from its feet. Before it could recover, she leaped on the beast's back as if mounting a wild stallion and jammed her aegeal into the base of its skull. It was a move that would have killed any man. When the beast reared up on its knees, she hooked the weapon across the front of its throat. With its good arm, the creature snatched Kara's aegeal and effortlessly ripped it from her grip. Kara vaulted for the weapon and snatched it back, but it cost her a blow that again sent her tumbling across the floor. As everyone clambered back from the creature, trying to stay out of the reach of its deadly claws, it threw its head back and roared. The sound was so deafening that everyone winced. Flashes of lightning lit beyond the windows, throwing blindingly bright light and a jumble of confusing shadows through the nearly dark room, making it difficult to see. Zed, Nathan, and Anne conjured shields of air and used them to try to force the threat back, but the beast was able to crash through the shields and charge for their creators, forcing them to dodge out of harm's way. Nietzsche knew that the three of them could not stop such a menace with the power they had. She didn't see how Richard could either. As the others continued to fight with every bit of ability and cunning they could muster, Nietzsche again seized a fistful of Kara's leather outfit at her shoulder and hauled her close. Are you ready to do it my way, or do you want Richard to die? Kara, panting from the exertion, looked ready to spit fire, but she heeded Nietzsche's words. What do you want me to do? Be ready to help me. Be ready to do exactly as I ask. After receiving a nod of agreement, Nietzsche scrambled back up onto the table. She placed one foot in the center of the grace drawn in her own blood and the other out beyond the outer circle. Zed, Nathan, and Anne threw everything they could conjure at the rampaging beast. Webs of arcing power that could have cut stone, intensely focused force that could have bent iron, a hail of air concentrated into nodules hard enough to pulverize bone. None of it had any effect on the creature. In some cases, it wasn't affected by their power, while at other times it swiped at the assaults, brushing them aside, or avoided them altogether by winking out of existence, only to reappear once the threat had passed. It again turned its attention to its purpose and lunged for Richard. He dodged to the side and once more used his knife to rip through the creature's tough hide, trying to sever an arm. That, too, Nietzsche knew would do no good. As the others shouted instructions, trying to find a way to destroy the threat, Kara, torn between helping Richard and following instructions, turned and peered up at Nietzsche. What are you doing? Nietzsche, not having the time to answer questions, pointed. Can you lift that candelabra? Kara glanced back over her shoulder. It was made of heavy wrought iron and held two dozen candles, none of them lit. Probably. Use it like a lance. Drive the beast back toward the windows. What good is that going to do? The beast lunged at Richard, trying to get its arms around him. Richard twisted away, and in the process landed a powerful kick to its head that did no more than momentarily stagger it. Just do as I say. Use it like a lance to drive the creature back and make sure that the others stand back and stay clear. 
You think that if I can club it with the candelabra, that will stop it? No, it learns. This will be something new. Just drive it back. It should be momentarily confused, or at least cautious. As soon as you force it back, throw the candelabra at it, and then get yourself clear. Kara, her lips pressed tightly together in frustrated fury, considered for only an instant. She was a woman who knew that hesitation could bring harm. She grabbed the heavy main post of the candle stand in both hands and with a mighty effort lifted it. The candles fell from their cups, bouncing and rolling across the stone floor. It was clear to Nietzsche how heavy the iron stand was. She thought, though, that Kara had enough muscle to handle it. There was no doubt that she had the metal. But Nietzsche could no longer worry about Kara. She put the woman from her mind and straightened both arms, extending her hands down toward the bloody depiction of the grace beneath her. She disregarded her doubts, her fears, and, as she had done countless times before, drew her mind back into the core of Han within herself. This time, above the grace, it felt like falling back into an icy pool of power. Ignoring the fate she was condemning herself to, she turned her palms upward and lifted her hands, using that icy pool of power within herself to begin to bring the verification web back to its induction point. From within the dominion of the grace, Nietzsche concentrated on a mental image of removing the countervailing blocks within the spell form that kept it contained and inert. With deliberate intent, once she had exposed the inner field that only she could see, she used both sides of her power to connect opposing junctions. In an instant, the green lines again started twisting their way up like some ravenous vine made of light. In a heartbeat, the network of lines was as high as her thigh. Kara thrusted and stabbed at the beast. Several times she made solid contact with her unwieldy iron weapon, knocking the creature back a step. Each time it took a step back, she immediately jabbed again, forcing it back another step, then another. Nietzsche had been right. The creature reacted cautiously to the unexpected nature of the attack. She hoped that Kara could get the beast back not only far enough, but in time. Bolts of lightning arced through the night sky, illuminating the wall of thick glass windows. Compared with the forces of the storm, the oil lamps were so weak as to be nearly useless. The flashes back and forth between blinding light and darkness made it difficult to see. As the glowing greenish lines that were the mere reflection of the inner aspect of a spell that had been created thousands of years before, by men long ago lost to history, wove their way up around her. That inner spell form, once again ignited, lancing through her far faster than it had the first time. Nietzsche hadn't been entirely ready. She went blind before she expected to. She struggled to breathe while she still could, while she still had a remnant of control. Her gifted vision began to flicker back and forth between both worlds, between the light of life and eternal blackness. The dark void beyond came and went in flashes, much like the lightning outside the window, but with blinding darkness rather than blinding light. Straddling both worlds, Nietzsche felt as if her soul would be ripped apart. She ignored the pain and focused on the task at hand. She knew that she could not destroy such a beast with her power alone. Sisters of the Dark had, after all, created it with the help of ancient powers that she could not begin to fathom. The conjured creature was the match of anything Nietzsche knew how to call forth. It would take something more than mere sorcery. Back near the windows, the beast finally dug in and halted its brief retreat. Kara jabbed at it, but the snarling beast would retreat no more. Kara was having difficulty handling the heavy iron candle stand. When Richard started to come to her aid, she yelled at everyone to get back. When he didn't obey, she swung the candle stand around, making him jump back and letting him know that she meant business. Putting all her strength into the effort, Nietzsche brought her palms up, 
preparing to do the impossible. She had to find the cusp between nothing and the ignition of power. She needed not power, but its precursor. The green lines advanced farther up around her in their determined work of encasing her in the totality of the spell. Nietzsche tried to draw a breath, but her muscles would not respond. She needed the breath, just one breath. When the world of life flashed back into her gifted vision, she pulled with all her might and at last drew that breath. Now, Kara! Without hesitation, Kara heaved the heavy candelabra. The beast easily caught the massive iron candle stand in one clawed hand, lifting it high. Behind it, through the windows, lightning cracked and boomed. Nietzsche paused, waiting for a lull in the flashes. When it came, when the room plunged back into darkness, she cast out not power, but its antecedent. That casting bathed the beast in the agonizingly almost, the inductive ignition of power, absent the consequence. She could see that the creature felt the strange sensation of the promise of the profound, not quite conjured, not yet delivered. It blinked in confusion, unsure if it really felt something, wanting to act, yet not knowing what it was that it felt or what to act against. Without the successful launch of any direct attack of Nietzsche's power, the beast appeared to decide that she had failed and again defiantly lifted the candelabra high over its head like a trophy won in battle. Now, Zed called to Anne and Nathan as he rushed forward, while it's distracted, they were about to ruin everything. Nietzsche could do nothing to halt their interference. Kara, never one to be gentle in her duty, did do something. She drove the three of them back like a sheepdog herding strays. They protested as they retreated, demanding she get out of the way. Nietzsche watched it all happen from a distant place on the cusp between worlds. She could no longer help Kara. The woman would have to handle it herself. Somewhere in the faraway world of life, Zed fumed at the moored Sith and tried to launch an attack, but Kara used the threat of ramming him with a shoulder to drive him back, throwing him not only off balance, but distracting him from his intentions. In that other world, the dark world beyond life, what Nietzsche had deliberately created was a void of effect, cause without consequence, a constructed expectation of a material release of her darker power, which she also deliberately failed to provide. Time itself seemed to stand still, waiting for what must be but would not come. The tension in the air around Nietzsche was palpable. The green lines around her raced ever faster through the air in an effort to completely re-establish the verification web to have her life held suspended. The flaw, like a spider in its web, waited for her. She knew she had only a fleeting moment before she would be unable to do anything. This time, her end would at least gain something of value. Nietzsche fed the field around the beast yet more of the open gateway to a profound release of power, which she purposely withheld. The stress between what existed and what did not yet exist and would not happen was insufferable. In an instant, that terrible, intolerable void, that vacuum of power that Nietzsche had created in both worlds, was filled with the deafening release of a bolt of lightning that came crashing in through the window, while its twin, from the world beyond the world of life, ripped through the veil, drawn to the need unfulfilled around the beast compelled to complete what Nietzsche had begun but would not finish. This time, there was no safety in escape to another world. Both worlds had together unleashed their fury. Shattered glass rained through the room. The thunderous boom shook the stone walls of the keep. It seemed as if the sun itself were exploding in through the window. 
The lines racing around Nietzsche came up like a shroud. Through her gifted vision, she saw the completion of the link she had established, saw the lightning find the void around the beast and fulfill the terrible empty obligation she had created. The explosion of that lightning was beyond anything that she had ever seen before. Creating the precursor in both worlds lent the lightning the power of both worlds. Additive and subtractive, creative and destructive, intertwined in a single calamitous discharge. Nietzsche was frozen by the spell and could not close her eyes against the blinding flash of light and dark that tangled together, striking both ends of the candelabra and blasting down through the beast. In the violent corona of crackling white light, the beast came apart, driven to dust and vapor by the intensity of the heat and power focused in the void Nietzsche had created. Gales of rain and wind roared in through the shattered window. Outside, yet more lightning flickered through the roiling greenish clouds. When the lightning outside lit the room, they could all see that the beast was gone. For now, anyway, it was gone. Through the net of green lines, Nietzsche saw Richard racing across the room toward her. That room seemed so distant. She saw the dark world close in around her. Chapter 8 When her horse whinnied and stamped its hooves, Kalin slipped her hand farther up the reins, closer to the bit, to hold the nervous animal in place. The horse didn't like what it smelled any more than Kalin did. She reached up and gently stroked the underside of the horse's chin as she waited behind sisters Ulyssia and Cecilia. Light gusts ruffled the cottonwood leaves overhead, making the glossy leaves shimmer in the midday heat. In the shade of those huge cottonwoods, Dappled sunlight danced over the grassy hilltop, while overhead a few cottony white clouds dotted the blindingly bright blue sky. When the breeze shifted around and came in from their backs, it brought relief not only from the sweltering heat. Kalin allowed herself a deeper breath. She used a finger to wipe sweat and grime from under the metal collar locked around her neck. She wished she could have a bath, or at least jump in a stream or a lake. The summer heat and dusty traveling had conspired to turn her long hair into an itchy, tangled mess. She knew, though, that the sisters didn't care how uncomfortable she was, and that they wouldn't be pleased if she were to ask if she could have a chance to wash up the way they often did. The sisters didn't care in the least about Kalin's wants, much less her comfort. She was their slave no more. It mattered not if the collar she wore around her neck chafed and rubbed her skin raw. As Kalin waited, her mind wandered to the statue she had given up, the statue she'd had to leave in Lord Richard Rawls' palace. While she had no memory of her past, she had memorized every line of that figure of a woman with flowing hair and robes. There was something quietly noble about her spirit, about the way the figure stood with her back arched, her hands fisted, and her head thrown back as if in defiance of invisible forces that would subdue her. Page 74 Kalin knew all too well what it felt like to have invisible forces subduing her. From the quiet hilltop, they watched as Sister Armina made her way across the open landscape below. There was no one else in sight. The long grasses looked almost liquid as they waved and bowed in the breeze. Sister Armina finally trotted her bay mare up the hill. She circled her horse around and came to a halt beside the rest of them. They're not there, she announced. How far ahead are they? Sister Ulyssia asked. Sister Armina lifted an arm to point. I didn't go much beyond those hills there. I didn't want to take a chance on being spotted by any of Chigang's gifted. As near as I can tell, though, the stragglers and camp followers have only moved on a day or two ago. 
When the breeze at their backs slackened, it allowed the smell to drift up the hill again. Kaylin wrinkled her nose. Sister Ulyssia noticed, but didn't comment. The sisters didn't seem to be at all bothered by the stench. Sister Ulyssia abruptly turned and stuffed a boot in a stirrup. Let's go have a look over the hills beyond, she said as she swung up into her saddle. Kaylin mounted up and followed after the other three women as they trotted their horses down the hill. She thought it odd how the sisters seemed unusually jumpy. They tended to be arrogantly bold in whatever they did, but now they were being cautious. To the left towered the rugged blue-gray shapes of lofty mountains. The rock slopes and cliffs were so imposing that there were few places where trees could gain a foothold. Some of the peaks were so high that they had snow atop them, despite it being summer. Kalen and the sisters had followed those mountains south since finding a place to cross over them after leaving the people's palace. In those travels, the sisters had avoided going near people whenever they could. Kalen gave her horse's reins a little more slack. The hills they rode across were rutted with gullies that made it difficult traveling at times. Kalen knew that there would probably be roads down out of the hills, but the sisters didn't generally like to travel on roads and kept off them whenever possible. As they moved through the tall grass among the scattered trees, they stayed in the concealing shelter of the folds of land between hills. Before Kalen could see any of what lay ahead, the unmistakable gagging stench of death grew so terrible that she could hardly breathe. Cresting a hill, she finally saw the city spread out below. They all paused, gazing down at the empty roads, the burned buildings, and the carcasses of what looked to be horses. Let's be quick, Sister Ulyssia said. We'll take the main road on the other side for a ways and get close enough to be sure of where they are and exactly the direction they're headed. They spurred their horses into canters, as they rode in silence down out of the hills and into the fringes of the city. The place looked to have been built up around a meandering bend in a river and the crossings of several roads that were probably trade routes. The larger of two timber bridges had been burned. As they crossed a narrow second bridge in single file, Kalen glanced down at the water. Bloated bodies, floating face down, had collected in the reeds, even before she had seen them, the stench of death had been so heavy in the air that she had lost her interest in going for a swim. She just wanted to be away from the place. As they rode in among the buildings, Kalen held a scarf over her nose and mouth. It didn't help much. She thought she might vomit from the fetid smell of rotting flesh. It seemed peculiar that it was so strong. She soon discovered why. They rode past side streets where corpses were piled in the hundreds. A few dogs and mules lay dead among them, the legs of the mules standing out straight and stiff. From the way the bodies were jammed into the narrow side streets, Kalen thought that the people must have been herded into confined spaces from which escape was impossible and then slaughtered. Most of the dead, animal and human, were ripped open with ghastly wounds. Some of the dead had broken lances jutting from them, while others had been killed by arrows. Most, though, appeared to have been hacked to death. Kalen noticed one other thing about them. They were all older people. Many of the buildings in one section of the city were burned down. Only in a few places did wisps of smoke still curl up from some of the thicker piles of rubble. The charred wooden beams looked like the scorched skeletons of monsters. It appeared to be a day or two since the fires had burned themselves out. Stepping their horses along the narrow cobbled street between two-story buildings looming up to either side of the road, they peered about in silent appraisal of the destruction. The buildings still standing had all been looted. Doors were broken in or lay in the street nearby. Kalen didn't see a single window that hadn't been broken. 
Curtains lay draped over a few of the tiny balconies overlooking the street. A few of those balconies held a body. Besides the fragments of wood from door frames and the broken glass, the streets were littered with trivial items, random articles of clothing, a bloody boot, pieces of broken furniture, broken weapons, broken pieces of wagons. Kalen saw a doll with yellow yarn for hair lying face down, its back flattened by a hoof print. All of the items had the look of having been picked over by a number of hands and, after being judged to be worthless, discarded. Daring to look into the dark buildings they passed, Kalen saw the real horrors. They were not merely the bodies of murdered townspeople. There were the bodies of people who looked to have been murdered for sport or out of a sheer brutality. Unlike the bodies heaped in the side streets, these people were not older. They looked like they might have been people trying to protect their shops or homes. Through one broken shop window, she saw that a man, wearing the kind of apron used by cobblers, had been nailed to a wall by his wrists. From the center of his chest protruded dozens of arrows, making him look like a grotesque pincushion. His mouth and each eye had been penetrated by an arrow. The man had not only been used for target practice, but as an object of monstrous humor. In other dark buildings, Kalen saw women who had all too obviously been raped. A shirt sleeve still on one arm was all that covered one woman on the floor. Her breasts had been mutilated. In another place, a girl, looking not to yet have grown into womanhood, lay sprawled on a table, her dress pushed up past her waist. Her throat had been cut through to her spine. Her legs lay splayed out, a broomstick left shoved in her as a final act of disdain. Kalen felt numb as she saw one horrifying sight after another, each of such lurid cruelty that she could not imagine the kind of men who could have committed such acts. By the manner of dress of many of the dead, the men appeared to be simple working people. They were not soldiers. For the crime of trying to protect their homes and businesses, they had been butchered. As Kalen passed one small building, she saw... In a back corner against a brick wall, a pile of small children, mostly babies. It was reminiscent of the way autumn leaves collected in a corner, except these all had once been living people with a life ahead of them. The gore on the brick wall betrayed where their heads had been bashed in. It was apparent that the killers had wanted to dispatch them as efficiently as possible. On the silent ride through the city, Kalen saw several more places where the very young had been cast into piles after being murdered in a fashion that could only be described as entertainment for the most monstrous of men. Although there were not very many women among the dead, Kalen didn't see one who was fully clothed. The ones she did see were either older or pretty young. Their treatment had been bestial beyond imagining, and their deaths slow. Kalen swallowed back the lump in her throat as she wiped her eyes. She wanted to scream. The three sisters didn't seem to be particularly moved by the carnage in the city. They watched down the side streets and gazed at the surrounding hills, apparently concerned about any sign of a threat. Kalen had never been so happy to leave a place as she was when they finally made their way out of the city and took a road leading southeast. The road turned out not to be the escape from the outrages of the city that she thought it would be. Along the way, the ditches were here and there filled with the bodies of unarmed young men and older boys, probably executed for trying to escape, resisting the idea of slavery as lessons to the others or simply for the sport of murder. Kalen felt dizzy and hot. She feared she might be sick. The way she swayed in her saddle only made her nausea worse. The stench of death and charred flesh followed them in the bright sunshine as they rode among the hills on the far side of the city. The smell was so pervasive that it felt as if it had saturated her clothes and was even coming out in her sweat. 
she doubted that she would ever again sleep without nightmares. Kalin didn't know what the name of the city had been, but it was no more. There hadn't been a single person left alive. Anything of any value had either been destroyed or looted. From the number of corpses, as vast as they had been, she knew that many of the city's inhabitants, mostly the women, the ones of the right age anyway, had been taken as slaves. After seeing what had happened to the women left dead in the city, Kalin could vividly imagine what would happen to the women taken away. The broadening plain and the hills to either side for as far as Kalin could see had been trampled by what had to be well beyond mere hundreds of thousands of men. The grasses had not simply been flattened by countless boots, hooves, and wagon wheels, but had been ground to dust under the weight of unthinkable numbers. The sight put into perspective the magnitude of the masses that had passed through the city, and in a way was more horrifying than the ghastly scenes of death. A force of men this huge bordered on a force of nature itself, like some terrible storm had cut a swath across the face of the land, mercilessly destroying everything in its path. Later in the day, as they approached the crest of a hill, the sisters carefully maneuvered into a position that put the sun low at their backs so that everyone ahead would have to stare into the sun to see them. Sister Ulyssia slowed and stood in her stirrups, stretching for a careful look, then signaled the rest of them to dismount. They all tied their horses to the carcass of a scraggly old pine split in two by lightning. Sister Ulyssia told Kalin to stay close behind them. At the edge of the hill, as they crouched silently in the weedy grass, they finally caught their first glimpse of what had come through the fallen city. In the dim distance, spread across the hazy horizon, was what at first appeared to be a muddy brown sea, but was actually the dark taint of an army of such numbers that it was beyond counting. Carried on the wind in the quiet late-day air, Kalin could just make out the distant blood-curdling sounds of howls, women's screams, and men's raucous laughter coming from the massive mob. The sheer weight of such multitudes would have crushed the defenses of any city. Any armed opposition would hardly have been noticed by an army as vast as this one. Men gathered in such numbers could not be halted by anything. But as much as this army seemed to be a mass, a mob, a thing, she knew that it was wrong to think of it in those terms. This was a group of individuals. These men had not been born monsters. Each had once been a helpless babe cradled in a mother's arms. Each had once been a child with fears, hopes, and dreams. While an occasional aberrant individual could, because of a sick mind, grow up to be a remorseless killer, this many individuals had not. Each was a killer by conviction to a cause, a killer by choice, all united under a banner of perverse beliefs that gave sanction to their savagery. These were all individuals who, when confronted with the choice, had willfully cast away the inherent nobility of life and chose instead to be servants of death. Kalin had been horrified at the butchery she'd seen back in the city, nauseated by the things she had seen. For a time, she'd hardly been able to breathe, not just from the stench of death, but from her tearful despair at such mindless brutality, at such monumental and intentional depravity. She felt a sense of sickening dread for those helpless souls yet to face the horde, and a crushing loss of any hope that life could ever be worth living that it could ever be reasoned and secure, much less joyous. But now, at the sight of the source of the slaughter, the great force of men who had all willingly perpetrated such atrocities, all those desolate feelings melted away. In their place, smoldering anger ignited, the kind of inner rage she didn't think a person very often felt in their life. 
remembering the old people who had been hacked apart, the infants dispatched by bashing in their brains, and the savage treatment of the women, Kalin could think of little else but her burning desire for vengeance for the silent dead. That sense of rage seethed through her, a rage so terrible that it seemed to forever change something within her. In that moment, she felt a profound affinity with the small statue she'd had to leave in Richard Rawls' peaceful garden, an understanding of its spirit that she hadn't had before. It's Jagang, all right, Sister Cecilia finally said in a bitter voice. Sister Armina nodded. And we have to get past him if we're to get to Casca. Sister Ulyssia gestured to the wall of mountains to the left. Their army, with all their horses, wagon, and supplies, can't cross the narrow passes between those peaks, but we can. As slow as Jagang moves, we can easily get over the passes, and then to Casca, long before they can travel south to get past the mountains, and then move up into Dahara. Sister Cecilia stared off to the horizon. The Daharan army doesn't stand a chance against that. That's not our problem, Sister Ulyssia said. But what about our bond to Richard Rall? Sister Armina asked. We're not the ones attacking Richard Rall, Sister Ulyssia said. Jagang is the one going after him, seeking to destroy him, not us. We are the ones who will wield the power of Auden, and then we will grant Richard Rall what only we will have the power to grant. That is enough to preserve our bond and protect us from the Dreamwalker. Jagang and his army are not our problem, and what they aim to do is not our responsibility. Kalin remembered being at the People's Palace and wondering what the man was like. Even though she didn't know him, she feared for him and his people, having to face what was coming for them. It will be our problem if they get to Casca before us, Sister Cecilia said. Besides catching up with Toby, Casca is the only other central site we can get into for now. Sister Ulyssia dismissed the notion with a flick of her hand. They're a long way from Casca. We can easily cut the distance and outpace them by going over the mountains rather than down, around, and then back up, as they will have to do. You don't think they might quicken their pace? Sister Armina asked. After all, Jagang might be eager to finally finish off Lord Rahl and the Daharan forces. Sister Ulyssia huffed at the very idea. Jagang knows the Daharan army has nowhere else to go. Richard Rahl has no choice now but to stand and fight. The matter is as good as decided. It's only a matter of time. The Dream Walker is in no hurry, nor could he be, not with an army that huge and unwieldy. And even if they could quicken their pace, they have to travel a much greater distance. So that still wouldn't get him to Casca before we can get there. Besides, Jagang's army is the same now as it has been since they first took over the old world decades ago and as it has been throughout this entire war. They never hurry their pace. They are like the seasons. They move with great force, but very slowly. She cast a meaningful look at the other two sisters. Besides, they've just stripped the city of women. Jagang's men will be eager to enjoy their new spoils. The blood drained from Sister Armina's face. Don't we know the truth of that? Jagang and his men never tire of the use of captive women, Sister Cecilia said, half to herself. Sister Armina's color came back in a red rush. I'd love to string Jagang up and have my way with him. We'd all enjoy a bit of dealing out lessons to those men, Sister Ulyssia said as she stared off into the distance. But we have better things to do, she smirked. Some day, though. The three sisters were silent for a time as they gazed off at the vast horde spread across the horizon. Some day, 
Sister Cecilia said in a low, rancorous voice. We will open the boxes of Auden, and we will have the power to make that man twist in the wind. Sister Ulyssia turned and headed back toward the horses. If we are ever going to open one of the three boxes, then we will first have to get to Tovey and the last box, and to what else is in Casca. Forget about Jagang and his army. This is the last we'll have to see them. Until the day comes when we've unleashed the power of Auden, and we can have a bit of fun dealing out our own personal retribution to the Dreamwalker. Chapter 9 Nietzsche opened her eyes. She saw only vague shapes. Zed is angry with you. Even though it sounded as if it had come from some hazy, faraway place, she knew that it was Richard's voice. She was surprised to hear it. She was surprised to hear anything. She thought that by all rights she should be dead. As her vision started coming into focus, Nietzsche rolled her head to the right and saw him sitting huddled close on a chair that had been pulled right up beside the bed. Leaning forward, elbows on his knees, his fingers folded neatly together, he was watching her. Why? she asked. Looking relieved to see her awake, he leaned back in the simple wooden chair and smiled that crooked smile of his that she so loved seeing. Because you broke the window back in that room where you were all doing the verification web. In the light of a lamp glowing softly beneath a milky white shade, she saw that she was covered up to her armpits in a luxuriously embroidered gold bed cover with lustrous sage-green fringe. She had on a satiny nightdress that she didn't recognize. The sleeves went all the way down to her wrists. It was pale pink, not her color. She wondered where the nightdress had come from, and more to the point, who had undressed her and put it on her. Back at the Palace of the Prophets so long ago, Richard had been the first person she'd ever met who didn't expect that he had a right to her body or some other aspect of her life. That forthright attitude had helped start the process of reasoning that eventually led to her casting off a lifetime of teachings of the Order. Through Richard, she had come to truly see that her life belonged to her alone. Along with that comprehension, she had since then discovered the dignity and self-worth in propriety. Right then, though, she had concerns other than finding herself in a pink nightdress. Her throbbing head felt impossibly heavy against the cozy pillow. Technically, she said, the lightning broke the window, not me. Somehow, Kara said from another chair tipped back against the wall beside the door, I don't think the distinction will much impress him. I suppose not, Nietzsche said with a sigh. That room is in the hardened section of the keep. Richard twitched a frown. It's where? She squinted slightly in an effort to bring his face more into focus. That section of the keep is a special place. It's hardened against intentional interference as well as aberrational and errant events. Kara folded her arms. Mind giving us the translation? The woman was in her red leather. Nietzsche wondered if that meant there was more trouble about, or if she was just surly from the beast paying them a visit. It's a containment field, Nietzsche said. We know very little about the ancient, bewilderingly intricate makeup of the chain fire spell. It's hazardous to even study such unstable components all tangled together the way that one is. That's why we were using that particular place to run the verification web. That room is in the original core of the keep, an important sanctuary used for tasks involving anomalous material. Various kinds of both constructed and free-formed conjuring are apt to contain innate tangential outflows that can convey domain breaches, 
So when working with them, it's best to confine such potentially hazardous components to a containment field. Oh, well, thanks for the translation, Kara said in a cutting tone. It's all so clear now. It's a field thing. Nietzsche nodded as best she could. Yes, a containment field. When Kara's frown only darkened, Nietzsche added, Doing magic in there is like keeping a wasp in a bottle. Oh, Kara let out a sigh, finally grasping the simplified concept. I guess that explains why Zed was so grumpy about it. Maybe he can fix it back to the way it was, Richard offered. Surprisingly enough, the room isn't too badly torn up. It's mostly the broken windows that he's riled about. Nietzsche lifted a hand in a weak gesture. I don't doubt it. The glass in there is unique. It has embedded properties designed to contain conjured magic from escaping and to prevent gifted assaults. Its function is much the same as shields, except that it deters power rather than people. Richard considered a moment. Well, he finally said, it didn't prevent an attack from the beast. Nietzsche stared off at the bookshelves built into the wall opposite the bed. Nothing can, she said. In this case, the beast didn't come through the windows or walls. It came through the veil, emerging out of the underworld right into the room. It didn't need to come through any shields or containment field or refractory glass. Kara's chair thumped down. And it nearly tore your arm off, she shook a finger at Richard. You were using your gift. You drew it to you. If Zed hadn't been there to heal you, you would likely have bled to death. Oh, Kara, every time you tell the story, I seem to bleed more. No doubt the next time I hear it told, I'll have been torn in two and stitched back together with magic thread. She folded her arms as she tipped her chair back against the wall. You could have been torn in two. I wasn't as badly hurt as you make it out. I'm fine. Richard leaned in a little and squeezed Nietzsche's hand. At least you stopped it. She met his gaze. For now, she said, that's all. For now is enough for now. He smiled in quiet satisfaction. You did good, Nietzsche. His gray eyes mirrored his inner sincerity. Somehow the world always seemed better when Richard was pleased that someone had accomplished something difficult. He always seemed to value what people achieved, always seemed to delight in their triumphs. It invariably lifted her heart when he was pleased with something she had done. Her gaze strayed from his face. She noticed the small statue standing on the table just behind him. The lamplight highlighted the flowing hair and robes that Richard had once so carefully carved into the figure of his impression of Kalin's spirit. The lustrous statue, sculpted from walnut, stood as if in silent defiance of some invisible force attempting to suppress that spirit. I'm in your room, Nietzsche said, half to herself. A curious frown twitched across his brow. How did you know? Nietzsche looked away from the statue to gaze out the small, round-topped window through the thick stone wall to the left. A delicate, pale blush of color was just visible in the lower reaches of a black, star-filled sky as dawn gradually approached. Lucky guess, she lied. It was closer, Richard explained. Zed and Nathan wanted to get you in a bed, get you comfortable, so they could evaluate what they needed to do to help you. Nietzsche knew by the lingering, icy feeling coursing through her veins that they had done something more than mere evaluation. Rika and I undressed you and put you in a nightdress Zed found for us, Kara explained to the unspoken question she must have seen in Nietzsche's eyes. Thanks. Nietzsche lifted a hand in a vague gesture. How long have I been unconscious? What happened? Well, Richard said, after you jumped back up into that spell form the night before last and called the lightning to stop the beast, 
the verification web nearly took you for good. After I got you out, Zed thought you needed to rest more than anything, so he did a little something so that you would sleep. You were a bit delirious from the pain you were in. He said that he helped you drift off so you wouldn't have to suffer it. He told us that you would sleep all of yesterday and last night and then awaken around dawn today. I guess he had it right. Kara rose to stand behind Richard and peer down at Nietzsche. No one thought that Lord Ra would be able to get you out the second time. They thought your spirit was too far gone into the underworld to ever get you back, but he did it. He got you back. Nietzsche looked from Kara's smug smile to Richard's gray eyes. They didn't reflect anything of the difficulty of the task. She had trouble imagining how he could have accomplished such a thing. You did good, Richard, she said, making him smile. He and Kara turned toward a soft knock at the door. Zed quietly eased the door open to peek in. When he saw that Nietzsche was awake, he shed his care and strolled in. Ah, he observed, back from the dead, it would appear. Nietzsche smiled. Wretched excursion. I don't advise a visit to the place. Sorry about the windows, but it was either... Better the windows than what might have happened to Richard. Nietzsche was cheered to hear him say as much. That was my thought. Sometime you will have to explain to me exactly what you did and how you did it. I wasn't aware that any form of conjured power could breach those windows. It can't. I simply invited a confluence of natural power to come in through the windows. Zed regarded her with an unreadable look. About the windows, he finally said in a measured tone, we might be able to use your ability with both sides of the gift to restore them. I'd be glad to help. Kara took a step forward. When Tom and Friedrich eventually get back from patrolling the surrounding countryside, I'm sure that they'd be able to help with the window's woodwork. Friedrich especially knows about working with wood. Zed nodded as he smiled briefly at the suggestion before turning to his grandson. Where have you been? I went looking for you this morning and couldn't find you. I've been looking for you all day. Nietzsche realized that the windows were hardly his primary concern. Richard glanced briefly at the statue. I read a lot last night. When it got light, I went for a walk to think about what to do next. Zed sighed at the answer. Well, as I told you after you broke the first spell form holding Nietzsche, we need to talk about some of the things you said. It was clear that it was not a matter of casual curiosity, but a pointed demand. Richard stood to help stuff pillows behind Nietzsche when he saw her start to sit up. The pain was becoming no more than a fading memory. Zed had obviously done something more than help her sleep. Her head was starting to clear. She realized that she was hungry. So talk, Richard said as he sat back down. I need you to explain precisely how you were able to know how to shut down a verification web, especially one as complex as the chain fire event matrix. Richard looked more than a little weary. I told you before, I understand the jargon of emblems. Zed clasped his hands behind his back as he started to pace. Concern was clearly etched in the lines of his face. Yes, about that. You mentioned that you know a lot about representational designs involving lethality. I need to know what you meant by that. Richard took a deep breath, letting it out slowly as he leaned back in his chair. Having grown up around Zed, he obviously knew quite well that when Zed wanted to know something, it was easiest to just answer the questions. Richard turned his wrists over across his knees. Strange symbols girded the leather-padded silver wristbands he wore. On the center of each band, at the insides of his wrists, there was a small grace. That alone was alarming enough, 
since Nietzsche had seen Richard use them to call the Sliff so that they could travel. She couldn't begin to imagine what the other symbols meant. These things all around the bands, the emblems, designs, and devices, are pictures representing things. Like I said before, they're a jargon, a language of sorts. Zed waggled a finger at the designs on the wristbands. And you can make out meaning in them, like you did with the spell form? Yes. Most are ways of fighting with the sword. That's how I was first able to recognize them and how I began to learn to understand them. Richard's fingers idly sought reassurance in the touch of the weapon's hilt, but it was no longer there at his hip. He caught himself and went on. Many of these are the same as the designs outside the first wizard's enclave. You know, on those brass plaques, on the entablature above the variegated red stone columns, on the round metal discs all along the frieze, and also carved into the stone of the cornice. He glanced over his shoulder at his grandfather. Most of these emblems overtly involve combat with a sword. Nietzsche blinked in surprise as she listened. Richard had never told her about the symbols on the wristbands. As first wizard, Zed had been the keeper of the Sword of Truth, and it was his duty to name a new seeker when needed, but given his reaction, she didn't think that even he had known about this. She supposed that was understandable. The sword, after all, had been made thousands of years before by wizards with prodigious power. That one, Zed thrust a bony finger at an emblem on one of Richard's wristbands. That one is on the door to the first wizard's enclave. Richard turned his other wrist and tapped a starburst pattern on the top of the silver band. As is this one here. Zed pulled Richard's arms closer, inspecting the wristbands in the lamplight. Yes, those are both on the door. He squinted a frown at Richard. And you honestly believe that they mean something? And that you've learned to read them? Yes, of course. Zed, his wiry brows drawing low, was still clearly dubious. What do you think they mean? Richard touched a symbol on the wristbands and one like it on his boot pins. He pointed out the same design within the gold band around his black tunic. Until he pointed it out, Nietzsche hadn't realized that it was hidden there, among the rest of what seemed to be nothing more than an elaborate decorative strip. The pattern looked like two rough triangles with a sinuous, undulating double line running around and through them. This one is a kind of rhythm used for fighting when outnumbered. It conveys a sense of the cadence of the dance, movements without iron form. Zed cocked an eyebrow. Movement without iron form? Yes, you know, movement that's not rigid, not prescribed and inflexible, yet is still deliberate, with specific intent as well as precise objectives. This emblem describes an integral part of the dance. The dance? Richard nodded. The dance with death. Zed's jaw worked a moment before his voice returned. Dance with death. He stammered a moment more with the halting beginnings of a flurry of questions before finally pausing and then retreating to something simpler. And how does this connect with the symbols at the first wizard's enclave? Richard burnished a thumb across the forms on the left wristband. The symbols would have meaning to a war wizard. That, in part, is how I figured it out. Symbols have significance in many professions. Tailors paint shears on their window. A weapons maker might paint the outline of knives over his door. A tavern might have a sign with a mug on it. A blacksmith, an anvil and a farrier might nail up horseshoes. Some signs, a skull with crossed bones beneath it, for instance, warn of something deadly. War wizards likewise put signs up on the first wizard's enclave. 
Even more importantly, each profession has its own jargon, a specialized vocabulary specific to that craft. It's no different with a war wizard. The jargon of his profession has to do with lethality. These symbols here and outside the first wizard's enclave are in part the sign of his craft, bringing death. Zed cleared his throat, then looked down and pointed at another symbol on Richard's wristband. This one here. This one is on the door to my enclave. Do you know its meaning? Can you paraphrase its intent? Richard turned his wrist slightly as he glanced down at the starburst symbol. It's an admonition not to allow your vision to lock on any one thing. The starburst is a warning to look everywhere at once, to see nothing to the exclusion of everything else. It's a reminder that you mustn't allow the enemy to draw your attention in a way that directs your vision and makes it settle on one thing. If you do, you will see what he wishes you to see. Doing so will allow him to blind you, in a manner of speaking, and he will then come at you without you seeing him, and you will most likely lose your life. Instead, like this starburst, your vision must open to all there is, never settling, even when cutting. To dance with death means to understand and become as one with your enemy, meaning with the way he thinks within the range of his knowledge, so that you know his sword as well as your own, its exact location, its speed, and its next move before it comes, without having to wait to see it first. By opening your vision in this way, opening all your senses, you come to know your enemy's mind and moves as if by instinct. Zed scratched his temple. You're trying to tell me that these symbols, signs specific to war wizards, are all instructions for using a sword? Richard shook his head. The word sword is meant to represent all forms of struggle not just combat or fighting with a weapon. It applies just as much to strategy and leadership, among other things in life. Dancing with death means being committed to the value of life, committed with your mind, heart, and soul, so that you are truly prepared to do what is necessary to preserve life. Dancing with death means that you are the incarnation of death, come to reap the living, in order to preserve life. Zed looked thunderstruck. Richard seemed somewhat surprised by Zed's reaction. All of this is much in keeping with everything you've ever taught me, Zed. The lamplight cast sharp shadows across Zed's angular face. I suppose that in a way it is, Richard, but at the same time it's so much more. Richard nodded as he rubbed a thumb across the softly glowing silver surface of a wristband. He seemed to search for words. Zed, I know that you would have wanted to be the one to teach me about all the things having to do with your enclave, like you wanted to be the one to teach me about the grace. As first wizard, it was your place to do so. Perhaps I should have waited. He brought up a fist in conviction. But there were lives at stake, and things I had to do. I had to learn it without you. Bags, Richard. How would I teach you about such things, he said in resignation. The meaning of those symbols has been lost for thousands of years. No wizard since... Since... Well, no wizard I know of has ever been able to decipher them. I have trouble imagining how you did. Richard shrugged one shoulder self-consciously. Once I began to catch on, it all became pretty obvious. Zed cast a troubled look at his grandson. Richard, I grew up in this place. I've spent a great deal of my life here. I was first wizard when there were actually wizards here to direct. He shook his head. All that time those designs were on the first wizard's enclave, and I never knew what they meant. It may seem simple and obvious to you, but it is not. For all I know, 
You're just imagining that you understand the emblems. Just making up meaning you want to be there. I'm not imagining their meaning. They've saved my life countless times. I learned a great deal about how to fight with a sword by understanding the language of these symbols. Zed didn't argue, but instead gestured at the amulet Richard wore around his neck. In the center, surrounded by a complex of gold and silver lines, was a teardrop-shaped ruby as big as Nietzsche's thumbnail. You found that in my enclave. Do you also have an idea of what it means? It was part of this outfit, part of the outfit worn by a war wizard. But unlike the rest of it, like you said, this was left in the protection of the first wizard's enclave. And its meaning? Richard's fingers reverently brushed the amulet. The ruby is meant to represent a drop of blood. The emblems engraved in this talisman are the symbolic representation of the way of the primary edict. Zed pressed his fingers to his forehead as if confounded by yet another confusing conundrum. The primary edict? Richard's gaze seemed lost in the amulet. It means only one thing and everything. Cut. Once committed to fight, cut. Everything else is secondary. Cut. That is your duty, your purpose, your hunger. There is no rule more important, no commitment that overrides that one. Cut. Richard's words came softly, with a kind of knowing, deadly seriousness that chilled Nietzsche to the bone. He lifted the amulet out away from his chest, his gaze fixed on its ornate engravings. The engraved lines are a portrayal of the dance, and as such they have a specific meaning. He traced a finger along the swirling designs as he spoke, as if following a line of text in an ancient language. Cut from the void, not from bewilderment. Cut the enemy as quickly and directly as possible. Cut with certainty. Cut decisively, resolutely. Cut into his strength. Flow through the gaps in his guard. Cut him. Cut him down utterly. Don't allow him a breath. Crush him. Cut him without mercy to the depths of his spirit. Richard glanced up at his grandfather. It is the balance of life, death. It is the dance with death, or, more precisely, the mechanism of the dance with death, its essence reduced to form, its form prescribed by concepts. It is the law a war wizard lives by, or he dies. Zed's hazel eyes were unreadable. So these marks, these emblems, ultimately regard a war wizard as a mere swordsman? The same overriding principle I told you about before applies to this just as it does the other symbols. The primary edict is not meant to merely convey how a war wizard fights with a weapon, but more importantly, with his mind. It's a fundamental understanding of the nature of reality that must encompass everything he does. By being true to the primary edict, any weapon is an extension of his mind, an agent of his intent. In a way, it's what you once told me about being the seeker. It's not the weapon that matters so much as the man who wields the weapon. The man who last wore this amulet was once first wizard. His name was Baracus. He also happened to have been born a war wizard, as am I. He, too, went to the Temple of the Winds, but when he returned, he went into the first wizard's enclave, left this there, came out, and committed suicide by leaping off the side of the keep. Richard's gaze drifted into distant visions and memories. For a time I understood and ached to join him. Nietzsche was relieved when the haunted look in his gray eyes was banished by the return of his easy smile. But I came to my senses. The room sang with the silence as if death itself had just silently glided through the room, paused for a moment, and then moved on. 
Zed at last smiled himself as he gripped Richard's shoulder, giving his grandson an affectionate joggle. I'm glad to know I made the right choice in naming you Seeker, my boy. Nietzsche wished that Richard still had the sword that belonged with the Seeker, but he had sacrificed it for information in an attempt to find Kalin. So, Zed said at last, getting back to the matter at hand, because you know about these symbols, you believe you understood symbols within the chain fire spell form. I was able to shut it down, wasn't I? Zed clasped his hands behind his back again. You have a point there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you could read forms within the spell as emblems, much less know that the spell form was corrupted by the chimes. Not the chimes themselves, Richard patiently explained, but the contamination left behind as a result of the chimes having been in this world. That corruption is what infected the chain fire spell. That's the issue. Zed turned away, his face hidden in shadows. But still, Richard, even if you actually do understand something of the emblems having to do with war wizards, how can you be sure that you accurately understand this? This, he gestured in the vague direction of the room where it had all happened, this other business with the chain fire spell and the chimes. I know, Richard insisted in a quiet voice. I saw the mark of the nature of the corruption. It was caused by the chimes. He sounded tired. Nietzsche wondered how long he'd been up. Because of the arid timbre to his voice and the slightest unsteadiness in his movements, she suspected that it had probably been days since he'd slept. Despite how weary he might have been, he sounded resolute in his conviction. She knew that it was his worry for Kalin driving him on. Nietzsche, having been pulled out of the spell form by him twice, wasn't one to want to so easily discount his theory. More than that, though, she had come to understand that Richard had an insight into magic that was very different from the conventional wisdom. At first, she had thought that his perception of how magic functioned in part through artistic concepts was a product of his having been raised without having been taught about magic, without having any exposure to it. But she had since come to see that that unique insight, along with his singular intellect, had enabled him to grasp an essential nature of magic that was fundamentally different from the orthodox teachings. Nietzsche had come to believe that Richard might actually understand magic in a way not envisioned by anyone since ancient times. Zed turned back, his face illuminated by the warm glow of lamplight on one side, and on the other, the faint, cold light of dawn. Richard, let's say you're right about the meaning of the symbols on those wristbands and the ones like them on the first wizard's enclave. Understanding those things does not mean that you can understand the lines within a verification web. It's a completely different and unique context. I'm not doubting your ability, my boy. I'm really not. But dealing with spell forms is a vastly complex matter. You can't leap to the conclusion... Have you seen a dragon in the last couple of years? Everyone in the room fell to stunned silence at Richard's sudden change of topic, and not just to any subject, but one that could only be described as strange at best. A dragon? Zed ventured at last, like a man inching out onto a newly frozen lake. Yes, a dragon. Do you recall seeing a dragon since we left our home in Westland and came to the Midlands? Zed smoothed back some of the wavy tufts of his white hair. He glanced briefly to both Kara and Nietzsche before answering. Well, no. I can't really say that I recall having seen any dragons, but what does that have to do... Where are they? Why haven't you seen any? Why are they gone? Zed looked at his wit's end. He spread his hands. Richard, dragons are very rare creatures. 
Richard leaned back in his chair, crossing one leg over his other knee. Red dragons are, but Kalin told me that other types are relatively common, with some of the smaller ones kept for hunting and such. Zed's expression turned suspicious. What are you getting at? Richard gestured with a sweep of a hand. Where are the dragons? Why haven't we seen any? That's what I'm getting at. Zed folded his arms across his chest. I give up. What are you talking about? Well, for one thing, you don't remember. That's what I'm talking about. The chain fire spell has affected more than just your memory of Kalin. Don't remember what, Zed sputtered. What do you mean? Instead of answering his grandfather, Richard looked back over his shoulder. Have you seen a dragon? he asked Kara. I don't recall any. Her gaze remained fixed on him. Are you suggesting that I should? Darken Rall kept a dragon. Since he was the Lord Rall at the time, you would have been at hand, so you would probably have seen it. Said and Kara shared a troubled look. Richard turned his raptor gaze on Nietzsche. You? Nietzsche cleared her throat. I always thought they were mythical creatures. There aren't any in the old world. If there ever were, they haven't existed for ages. No records since the Great War have any mention of them. What about since you came to the New World? Nietzsche hesitated at recounting the memory. She realized, though, by the way he patiently and silently waited for her answer, that he wasn't going to let the subject go. She knew that whatever obscure equation he was working to solve wouldn't involve anything trivial. Under his silent scrutiny, Nietzsche felt not only a compulsion to answer, but a rising sense of foreboding. She threw the bed covers back and swung her feet down off the side of the bed. She didn't want to be lying there any longer, especially when speaking about that time. Gripping the side rail, she met Richard's gaze. When I was taking you away to the old world, before we left the new world, we came across colossal bones. I never got down off my horse to look at them, but I remember watching you walk through those rib bones, rib bones that were well beyond twice your height. I had never seen anything like them. You said that you believed that it was the remains of a dragon. I thought that they must have been ancient bones. You said they were not, that they still had scraps of flesh on them. You pointed out all the flies buzzing around it as proof that it was what was left of a rotted carcass, not ancient remains. Richard nodded at the memory. Zed cleared his throat. And have you ever seen a dragon, Richard? One that was alive, I mean. Scarlet. What? That was her name, Scarlet. Zed blinked with incredulity. You have seen a dragon, and it has a name? Richard stood and went to the window. He rested his hands on the stone opening, leaning his weight on it as he gazed out. Yes, he said at last. Her name was Scarlet. She helped me before. She was a noble beast. He turned back from the window. But that's not the point. The point is that you knew her too. Zed's eyebrows lifted. I knew this dragon? Not as well as Kalin or I, but you knew her. The chain fire event has obviously corrupted your memory of it. Chain fire was meant to make everyone forget Kalin, but everyone is forgetting other things as well, things that were connected with her. For all I know, you might once have known the meanings of the emblems outside the first wizard's enclave better than I do. If you did, that memory is lost to you. How many other things have been lost? I don't know much about the various ways to use magic but when we were fighting the beast the other night, it seemed to me that in the past all of you used more inventive spells and powers than the simple things you tried against the threat, except maybe what Nietzsche did at the end. This is what the men who came up with the chain fire spell feared most. 
This is why they didn't ever want it ignited. This is why they never even dared test it. They feared that once such an event was initiated, it might spread, destroying connections removed from the primary target of the spell, in this case, Kalen. Your memory of Kalen is lost. Your memory of Scarlet is lost. Your memory of even having seen dragons is apparently lost as well. Nietzsche stood. Richard, no one is arguing that the chain fire spell isn't terribly dangerous. We all know that. We all know that our memories have been damaged by the ignition of a chain fire event. Do you have any idea how disturbing it is to be intellectually aware that we all did things, knew things, and knew people that we now can't remember? Don't you realize how haunting it is to be in constant dread of what memories are lost and what others might be lost, that your very mind is eroding? What are you getting at, anyway? Just that. What else is being lost? I think that the destruction is expanding through everyone's memory, that their minds are eroding, as you put it. I don't think that chain fire was a single event of merely forgetting Kalen. I think that the spell, once activated, is an ongoing dynamic process. I think that everyone's memory loss is continuing to spread. Zed, Kara, and Nietzsche all looked away from Richard's unwavering gaze. Nietzsche wondered how they could expect to help him if none of them were consciously capable of using their own minds, much less keeping what they still had from day to day. How could Richard trust any of them? I'm afraid that as bad as that much of it is, it gets more involved and far worse, Richard said, the heat having left his voice. Dragons, like many creatures in the Midlands, need and use magic to live. What if the corruption caused by the chimes extinguished the magic that they need in order to live? What if no one has seen any dragons for the last couple of years because they no longer exist and with chain fire are now forgotten? What other creatures with magic might have also vanished from existence? Richard tapped a thumb against his own chest. We are creatures of magic. We have the gift. How long until that taint left by the chimes begins to destroy us? But perhaps, Zed's voice trailed off when he could think of no argument. The chain fire spell itself is contaminated. You all saw what it was doing to Nietzsche. She was in the spell, and she knows the terrible truth of it. Richard began pacing as he spoke. There is no telling how the contamination within the spell might change the way it works. It might even be that the contamination is the reason that everyone's memory loss is spreading beyond what would have otherwise happened. But worse yet, it appears that the corruption has worked in conjunction with the chain fire event in a symbiotic fashion. Zed looked up. What are you talking about? What is the mindless purpose of the chimes? Why were they created in the first place? For one single function, Richard said in answer to his own question. To destroy magic. Richard paused his pacing to face the rest of them as he went on. The contamination left by the chimes is destroying magic. The creatures that need magic to live, dragons, for example, would likely be the first to be affected. That cascade of events will continue, but no one is aware of it because the chain fire event is simultaneously destroying everyone's memory. I think this may be happening because the chain fire spell is contaminated, causing everyone to forget the very things being lost. In much the way a leech numbs its victim so that they won't feel their blood being drained away. The chain fire spell is making everyone forget what is being lost because of the corruption of the chimes. The world is changing dramatically, and no one is even aware of it. It's as if everyone is forgetting that this is a world that is influenced by, and in many ways functions through, the existence of magic. That magic is dying out and so is everyone's memory of it. 
Richard again leaned on the sill and stared out the window. A new day is dawning, a day in which magic continues to die out, and no one is even aware that it is fading away. When it passes entirely, I doubt that anyone will even remember it, remember what once was. It's as if all that was this world is passing into a realm of mere legend. Zed pressed his fingers to the table as he stared into the distance. The light of the lamp accentuated the deep creases of his drawn features. His face had gone ashen. At that moment, Nietzsche thought that he looked very old. Dear spirits, Zed said without looking up, what if you're right? They all turned to the sound of a polite knock. Kara pulled the door open. Nathan and Anne stood beyond the doorway, peering in. We ran the standard verification web, Nathan said as he entered behind Anne, glancing around at the somber expressions. Zed looked up expectantly. And? And it reveals no flaws, Anne said. It's perfectly intact in every way. How can that be? Kara asked. We all saw the trouble with the other one. It nearly killed Nietzsche, and would have if Lord Rall hadn't gotten her out. Our point exactly, Nathan said. Zed's gaze fell away. An interior perspective is said to be able to reveal more than the standard verification process, he explained to Kara. This is not a good sign. Not a good sign at all. The contamination apparently buried itself as deeply as possible in order to conceal its presence. That's why it wasn't seen in the standard verification web. Or else, Anne offered as she slipped her hands into opposite sleeves of her simple gray dress. There is nothing really wrong with the spell. After all, none of us has ever run an interior perspective before. Such a thing hasn't been done in thousands of years. It's possible we did something wrong. Zed shook his head. I wish it were so, but I now believe it to be otherwise. Nathan's brow drew down with a suspicious look, but Anne spoke before he had a chance. Even if the sisters who unleashed the spell ran a verification web, she said, they likely would not have run an interior perspective so they wouldn't have suspected that it was contaminated. Richard rubbed his fingertips back and forth across his brow. Even if they knew that it was contaminated, I don't think they cared. They wouldn't be concerned about what damage such contamination might cause the world. Their goal, after all, was to get the boxes and unleash the power of Orden. Nathan looked from one grim face to another. What's going on? What's happened? I'm afraid that we've just learned that memory may only be the beginning of our loss. Nietzsche felt rather odd standing before them in a pink nightdress as she pronounced the end of the world as they knew it. We are losing who we are, what we are. We are losing not just our world, but ourselves. Richard no longer seemed to be paying attention to the conversation. He was standing stock still, staring out the window. Someone is coming up the road to the keep. Maybe it's Tom and Friedrich, Nathan said. Zed shook his head as he made for the window. They wouldn't be back from a patrol of the surrounding countryside this soon. Well, it could be that they... It's not Tom and Friedrich, Richard said as he started for the door. It's two women. Chapter 10 What is it? Rika called out as Richard, Nietzsche, and Kara ran toward her. Nathan and Anne had already fallen far behind. Zed was somewhere in the middle. Come on, Richard shouted to her as he ran past. Someone is coming up the keep road, Kara called back over her shoulder as Rika joined in the charge through the halls. Richard veered around a long stone table set against the wall beneath a huge painting of a lake. Sheltered trails could be seen burrowed through the deeply shadowed pine groves. 
In the distance, through a bluish haze, majestic mountains rose up to catch brush strokes of golden sunlight. It was a scene that made Richard long to be back in his heartland woods on the trails he knew so well. More than anything, though, the painting always reminded him of the magical summer he'd spent with Kalin in the home he had built for her far back in the mountains. The summer of Kalin's recovery from her terrible injuries, as he showed her the natural beauty of his forested world, and she once again blossomed back to health, had been one of the happiest times of his life. It had ended all too suddenly, when Nietzsche had arrived without warning and taken him away. He knew, though, that if Nietzsche had not interrupted it, everything else would have. It had been a dream time that had to end. Until the looming threat from the Imperial Order was halted, no one could live their dreams. They would all, instead, be swept up in the same nightmare. They turned a corner around a green marble pillar with a gold capital and base and all plunged down a spiral run of granite steps, Richard and Nietzsche in the lead, with the two moored Sith following close on their heels. The stairwell was small for the keep, but would have dwarfed anything Richard had ever seen growing up back in Westland. At the bottom, he slid to a halt, momentarily pausing to decide which would be the quickest route. In the keep, it wasn't always the way it would seem. Besides that, it was as easy to get lost in the keep as it was to lose one's direction in a birch forest. Kara pushed through between Richard and Nietzsche, not only to be sure that there would be a red leather-clad guard to each side of him, but so that she would be the one out ahead of him. As far as Richard knew, Mord Sith didn't have rank, but Rika, like the other Mord Sith, always wordlessly conceded Kara's unspoken authority. Richard recognized the unique pattern of the thin black and gilded bands lining both sides of the mahogany wainscoting in one of the paneled corridors to the side. From almost since the time he had learned to walk, Richard had used the details of his surroundings to know his way. Like trees in the woods that he recognized because of some peculiarity like a twisted limb, a growth, or a scar, he had learned to navigate through the keep and places like it by the details of architecture. He gestured. This way. Kara charged off ahead of him. As they ran, their boot strikes echoed off the stone floor of the hall. Nietzsche was barefoot. He was somewhat surprised that without shoes, she could keep up running across the rough stone. Nietzsche was not the kind of woman Richard ever envisioned running in bare feet. Even running in bare feet, though, she still looked somehow regal. It wasn't all that long ago that Richard would not have imagined Nietzsche ever running again. He was still surprised that he had managed to get her out of the spell form after the lightning had exploded through the window. For a time, he was sure that they had lost her. If Zed had not been there to help after Richard had shut down the verification web, they very well might have. They turned down another hall, Long carpets quieted their run and finally led them between two highly polished red marble columns and into the oval-shaped anteroom. A balcony supported by pillars and arches ran around the perimeter of the room. The doorways at the back of the balcony were all corridors, arranged like the spokes of a wheel that led to different levels and areas of the keep. Richard bounded down the five steps ringing the room inside the columns and ran past the great clover-leaf-shaped fountain centered in the tiled floor. The fountain's waters cascaded down successive tiers of ever-wider scalloped bowls to end up in a pool contained by a knee-high white marble wall that also served as a bench. A hundred feet overhead, a glassed roof flooded the room with warmth and light. When he reached the far side of the room, Richard pushed ahead of Kara, and threw open one of the heavy double doors. He paused on the top of the dozen wide granite steps outside. Nietzsche halted beside him, to his left, with Rika on the far side of her. Kara took a defensive place close by on his right. 
All of them were still catching their breath from the brief but swift run through the keep. The grass in the paddock across the way was lush and green in the early morning light. Beyond the paddock, the wall of the keep rose straight up, making the inner courtyard seem like a cozy canyon. The passing of millennia had left the soaring wall of tightly fitted dark stone stained with pale tan sediment. Creamy drips of calcium deposits gave the impression that the rock was slowly melting. Two horses clopped through the dark arched opening to the left, which tunneled under part of the keep to gain access to the inner courtyard. Richard couldn't tell who it was, hidden as they were back in the deep shadows of the broad low archway, but whoever it was must have known where they were going, and they apparently weren't afraid to enter an interior area of the keep, an area used not by visitors but by wizards and those who had worked with them at the complex. But that was long ago. Still, Richard recalled his own trepidation the first time he cautiously ventured this far into the grounds of the keep. His hackles rose at who might be bold enough to ride right into such a place. When the two riders emerged into the light, Richard saw that one of them was Shota. The witch woman locked eyes with him and smiled that quiet, knowing, private smile she wore so naturally. Like most other things about Shota, Richard didn't entirely trust the smile as significant, much less sincere, and so he couldn't be sure that it augured well. He didn't recognize the woman, maybe ten or fifteen years older, who rode deferentially half a length behind Shota. Short, sandy hair framed the woman's pleasant face. Her eyes were as intensely blue as the sky on a sparkling, clear autumn day. Unlike Shota, she wore no casual smile. As they rode, her head swiveled, and those blue eyes searched as if she feared an imminent attack of demons who might materialize out of the dark stone of the surrounding walls. Shota, by contrast, looked calm and self-confident. Kara leaned past Richard toward Nietzsche. Shota, the witch woman, she whispered confidentially. I know, Nietzsche answered, without taking her eyes off the beautiful woman riding toward them. Shota brought her horse to a halt close to the steps. As she straightened her shoulders, she casually rested her wrists across the saddle's pommel. I need to see you, she said to Richard, as if he were the only one standing there. The smile, sincere or not, had vanished. We have much to talk about. Where is your murderous little companion, Samuel? Shota, riding side saddle, slipped down off her horse in a way that Richard imagined must be how a spirit would slip to ground if spirits rode horses. A hint of indignation narrowed Shota's almond-shaped eyes. That is one of the things we need to talk about. The other woman dismounted as well, and took the reins to Shota's horse when the witch-woman lifted them to the side, much the way a queen would, not knowing or caring who would take them, but expecting without any doubt whatsoever that someone would. Her gaze remained fixed on Richard as she glided closer to the broad granite steps. Her thick, wavy auburn hair tumbled down over the front of her shoulders and glistened in the early light. Her revealing dress made of an airy, rust-colored fabric that complemented perfectly the color of her hair, seemed to float with her effortless strides, clinging to her every curve, at least the ones it covered. Shota's gaze finally left Richard to take in Nietzsche with an I dare you look. It was the kind of look that would have withered just about anyone. It failed to wither Nietzsche in the least. It struck Richard that he was probably in the presence of the two most dangerous women alive. He half expected dark thunderclouds to roll in and lightning to flicker, but the sky remained defiantly clear. Shota's gaze finally slid back to Richard. Your friend Chase has been gravely hurt. Richard didn't know what he had been expecting Shota to say, 
but that wasn't even close. Chase! Zed suddenly arrived and pushed his way through between Richard and Kara. Shouta! he declared in a huff. His face had gone red, and it wasn't from his run through the halls. How dare you come into the keep? First you swindle Richard out of the sword, and then... Richard lifted an arm out across his grandfather's chest to stop him from charging down the steps. Zed, calm down. Shota says that Chase has been badly hurt. How does she think? Zed's voice abruptly clipped off when Richard's words finally sank in. His wide eyes turned back to Shota. Chase? Hurt? Dear spirits, how? Zed suddenly caught sight of the other woman standing a little farther back, holding the reins to the horses. He squinted against the bright light. Jebra? Jebra Bevinvier? The woman smiled warmly. It has been quite a while. I wasn't sure that you would remember me, Wizard Zorander. This time Richard didn't try to stop Zed when he rushed to descend the steps. He embraced the woman in a warm and protective hug. Wizard Zorander, Zed, remember? She drew back to peer up at his face. A smile broke through the sadness that weighed so heavily in her eyes. Her smile ghosted away. Zed, my vision has gone dark. Gone dark? Concern tightening his features, he straightened and gripped her by the shoulders. How long ago? A terrible anguish flooded back into her blue eyes. Nearly two years. Two years, Zed said, his voice trailing off in dismay. I remember you now, Richard said as he moved down the steps. Kalen told me about you. Jebra cast Richard a puzzled frown. Who? The phantom he chases, Shota said, her unwavering gaze fixed on him as if daring him to argue. The woman he seeks is no phantom. Nietzsche said, drawing Shota's attention. Thanks in part to the pricey and rather equivocal suggestions you offered, we have discovered the truth of what Richard has been telling us all along. Apparently you are still in the dark about it. Nietzsche's icy look reminded Richard that she had once been known as Death's mistress. The cold authority in her voice matched the look. There were few women in the world as widely feared as Nietzsche had once been, except, perhaps, for Shota. Nietzsche's demeanor indicated that she was clearly a woman still to be feared.